comments from uh, Cedar Brook Committee members? Questions or comments from any board members? From the public? Hearing none, uh, do I hear a, a motion to recommend moving to the full board with a positive recommendation? So moved. Second. <laughs> Richards, Osborne, and Holt in succession. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> I couldn't tell who it was down here. Uh, I believe that's the piece I did. Thank you, Mr. Camillo. Thank you. Super focus closed.
um, an in-depth report on the uh, local housing market, and uh, most importantly, uh, the strategic plan, which is basically outlining our priorities for spending CDBG over the next five years. And the process of coming to those priorities um, is a series of stakeholder meetings, um, which uh, Urban Design Ventures will run, meeting with all of you, local officials, municipal, um, nonprofits, and holding multiple um, outreach sessions um, to local citizens as well. Um, so that will outline the priorities for spending um, and over the next five years. We use Urban Design Ventures in the past. Uh, this will be their first five-year plan um, for us. In the past, we have used um, a different firm. But we have been contracting with UDB for similar services since 2013. Have we been satisfied with their services? I was satisfied, yes. Any questions from the committee? From the board? Thank you, Commissioner Graves. Lori, why did we change? Why did we change um, the consultants? Yes. Um, the services of the previous consultant kind of, um, um, they were, the quality was decreasing over the years and we were frustrated. So we switched to UDB uh, and we've been satisfied ever since. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a motion on this particular matter? I'm sorry, to any public conversation or questions? Is there a motion on this particular matter? So moved. And I'll second. Second from Commissioner Zanelli. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. We also have an um, amendment to another professional services agreement with the same people. Can you address that thing? Sure. Again, Lori Boyer, Brandon Housing Manager. Um, okay, so the amendment um, is the second and final extension to the contract that was passed via Resolution 2016-56. This contract um, allows for the provision of three specific reports, plus gives us um, an allocation of $5,000 should we need to tap into it. Um, should we run into any um, lucky situations with clients when we need um, that technical assistance with the, with the consultants. Three reports, which are required for annual reports, um, is, the, uh, is an environmental review for a Lehigh County uh, CPG project, the consolidated annual performance evaluation report, uh, the CAPER, which is basically the year end report, um, and then also the environmental review for the Housing Authority, which is reimbursed um, to us in full. Are there any questions from the audience? From the commissioners? From the public? <laughs> is there a motion related to this particular uh, resolution? Seconded. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Lori. Frank, are you going to be uh, introducing the, the, the bill? We'll be introducing the bill and then for an intelligent discussion we'll bring up the issues. All right. So this is a, uh, we're, we're very excited about this. This is a, a fair grant that we applied for and received that's Pennsylvania Housing Affordability and Rehab Rehabilitation, I think is what it stands for. But it's part of our, our blight task force. So one of the things that, that we identified, that the blight task force identified um, as a problem is that local you know, municipalities don't have all the resources that they need to come back with. And, and, and our redevelopment authority can has other tools at its disposal that municipalities don't have. So this money will uh, be used to, um, to to attack some targeted properties in Slayton, that is where we, we found some that we think we can acquire and, and rehab and 
get back you know, into productive use. Dan Beers is the executive director of our housing authority. We have County Housing Authority. He's also the executive director of the um, we have County Redevelopment Authority. It's the same, so they have the same board and, and, and personnel. Um, and they would be the developer of these projects. So if you have any specific questions, he's much better equipped to answer. Um, Virginia, your office is about getting a, a, a summary of the, the program. Um, it's worth noting that the department pursued a little over, well, more than three hundred thousand dollars in funding, and it was awarded a hundred thousand um, dollars that you see in this resolution. Um, Frank, can you briefly uh, give us an understanding of how that affects this particular uh, potential program and other? Sources of funding that you might be more sure. Um, that's I mean that's a it's a really big deal if we have that, um, and that's what we're here tonight to, to accept and to uh, so partner with. Grateful for the hundred thousand dollars and the opportunity. Certainly to, to to the state and the people like Representative Schlossberg and others who you know who, who vote on these things. But um, uh, we also have a hundred thousand or we put money from CDBG uh, into a fund that we we could also use to match this, and we have affordable housing trust fund dollars that haven't been assigned yet, but we, we have them available with us. So between those three pots of funding, you know, we, we expect quick success. Are there questions from the committee? Commissioner Grant? Yeah, I, I have one question. Is there anything to go analysis that says it's one property or eight property? I heard you say earlier this property was in the borough site. So well, it's not, I, I don't, I mean, maybe we bring Van up at this point. I don't know that we have, well, this property, this, I think yeah, there are multiple it, properties. To address, a, to address a blight remediation property, that's what I'm saying. Here. We want to get one success under our belt. Maybe that's not the best way I'm saying. Hi, good evening. I'm Dan Beers, the executive, executive director of the Nat County Housing Authority. Uh, Frank is right. Uh, with the amount of dollars that are available to us, we want to try to address one property, one uh, property, in the <coughs> possibly two, depending on the construction of the dollars. And the intent here would be to acquire the properties, uh, rehabilitate them, and sell them to uh, uh, a supportable ownership. So in, in the, the acquisition and the sale, the, the, yeah, there's a, uh, an output and then there's a return. Do you have any general understanding of what the return would be after you've done the rehab? Good question. Uh, a lot of it is dependent upon what we acquire the property for when it costs rehab, obviously. Uh, beyond that, it's, uh, we market probably to 80% of median income of the buyer, which is typically family for about $60,000. So you're trying to, uh, the combination of all those funds allows us to basically break down the cost of the home to that home buyer so they can afford to buy it. A return on it, uh, it's kind of hard to predict. Uh, any return that would come onto it would be regenerated back into, you know, continuing use. So if you Kind of uh, uh, revolving. That would be the hope, yeah. Uh, yeah. Commissioner Osborne. Thank you, Commissioner Price. And um, when you rehabilitate, let's say in this case, the home that you may have in mind, um, do you look at whether there's light paint in the building or home yeah. or not? Yeah, when, when the property is acquired, it's required that the environment be done. So there is a there's light based type, uh, testing done. And if there is, if it does test positive for lead paint, what do you do? Well, it has to be remediated according to whatever regulations uh, that are required. So you've got to uh, acquire a contractor that is lead based certified you know, prior to the job. Great, thank you. Sure, Commissioner Snell. I'm curious if there is a deed restriction placed on these homes once we sell them for owner occupied so that they don't turn into rentals? Yeah, our, our hope here is uh, to partner with the community land trust. Uh, what the land trust does is they uh, they acquire rehab. When the property is completed, it's uh, sold to a, a, an affordable home buyer. That home buyer then uh, enters into a lease agreement with the community land trust that perpetuates that home's affordable housing for 99 years, and it has to be a for sale property. So does it have to be so, owner occupied? Yeah, it has to be owner occupied. That, that the buyer can't rent the Okay, so there is a deed restriction. It's a lease restriction. Okay. So a deed restriction goes to the lease. Okay. But 
but it does the same thing. Yes. Good enough. Commissioner Grant, I just wanted to question. We don't need anyone at the staff. Yeah. When you acquire a home like this or a property like this, uh, is there uh, any responsibility on the previous owner to repay the capital that you do for the insurance? I don't That's good. <laughs> I mean, not at that point, but the well, property gets to this point. So that's what, like, really is when you talk to the municipal officials. I mean, it's endless attempts to get people to, maybe they're not taxable, but maybe they're just blighted and people continue to get taxed. And that was the case, you know, that, that's the case on property sometimes. And, and, you know, at the point where we take it over, how do we take it over at that point? You can't, you can't well, get a clean title. We have to get a clean title. I mean, every effort is always made to get these people to pay their taxes. It ends in a sale. But the problem is, these are not ready to sell the tax sale. So there's not much that can be done outside of those already. That's not really the, the problem is that there's a blighted property in the middle of the main slave thing where they're choosing this property that drags everybody else's you know, property value. The, the, the loss of tax dollars is ancillary to that problem because you lose a lot more tax dollars go after it. Okay, thank you. Other commissioners? Oh. Okay. Is there a recommendation related to this resolution? Okay. No. Okay. Any further discussion? Those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, this gets first read this evening, and then we'll be up for uh, second read at our uh, meeting on the 24th. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned. Commissioner Dockery, we will need to wait for 7.15 to publish that. Yes. <coughs>
Now, I, I got a little concerned since we've got the audited end of the year financial statement presented to us in January, February, I can't remember what it was. Now, I understand they're unaudited, but they showed a surf well. 13.3 million, but 8 million was still encumbered. It boiled down to 3.3 million. However, the audit shows that there was a 1.6 million dollar surplus. Okay, maybe that's the correct number, uh, but that was kind of a big difference there. Um, but the audit also shows positive variances totaling 5.8 but 8 million. The stabilization fund as of 2nd August shows only 102,777 in over the 25 million. So there's some different numbers here. Even if we just stick with the audit at 1.6 million, why isn't the uh, stabilization fund at 26.6 million? So my question is, can this money be spent without board approval? I think we need to look at that process in a little more detail. I, you know, we went through years of asking what is the revised budget, and you know, we all got schooled on in conferences and all that. Fine. I understand that. I even think those may be looked at because if there's projects that were never even started, that money should be looked as fresh money. So I think after this process, I'll write down some ideas. But basically, the average variance of is $9.5 million to the good. If you look at the 2017 actual expenditures, that's 8.94% of the expenditure budget. That's a pretty big number. Another myth, especially here with school districts, we have to raise property taxes every year to keep up with inflation. That's called a static model analysis. So what I did here, I calculated tax revenue dollars per mill, because basically that normalizes the data. So if you have tax hikes or tax cuts, what you really care about is the dollars per mill, okay? So if you look at this, I eliminated 2013 because that was a big aberration year because it was a reassessment and a tax cut and everything else. I mean, that, that year it just, it messes everything up. I have those numbers if anybody's interested. But basically in static analysis, if you keep the tax rate flat, there's no increase in the dollars per mill, correct? If, you, uh, if there's a tax cut, you'd actually see an increase in the dollars per mill because you're collecting, quote unquote, the same amount of revenue with a smaller bill number, so that increases the dollars per mill. A tax light would see a mirror drop by the same percentage per mill, okay? So if you, if you look here, I looked at 2014, 15, 16, 17. The two years there was no change to tax, the, re the revenue per mill increased. Why? Your property tax base increases. This is what I call the natural growth rate. You actually get more revenue, and most entities naturally do the more growth. Another office building, new restaurant, a renovated restaurant, some new townhouses, etc. So, and even with the two tax cuts, for, for instance, if you look at that second year with a 2.9% tax cut, that means the profit dollars per mill should have gone up 2.9%. Now it went up 3.3. You still have revenue growth per mill, okay, even with a tax cut. The last number, I feel like there's something wrong with this. I look at the debt, but I've been saying for about eight years, if we don't add massive amounts of debt every year, another reason I was an advocate of cash for carry starting four or five years ago, at least started, I'm not saying it all in one swoop yet. But I look at the debt projections, and as you can see there, According to what I saw in the audit, and if the payments are being reduced by $107 million a year, doesn't that free up a lot of cash now? To be able to catch Mr. Reeves in the hallway, is my conclusion right now is what am I missing? Because that seems pretty significant. I mean, if, if you look at it, that'd be like your mortgage going from $1,800 to, uh, what, $170. That's, that'd be a pretty significant freeing up of cash flow for a family. So I'm just curious why we're not seeing that. Uh, even if you add a Cedarbrook bond, that's going to have fall market. No, I'm an engineer. I'm not going to use detail. You don't know the interest rate, everything else. But I figure I'm on three, three and a half million a year. So we're having significant debt payment relief. In fact, by this number, it looks like we can write a check for cash for Cedarbrook. So something, something isn't quite right. So I'm hoping uh, the board and maybe Mr.
Very nice. Thank you. 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 Sponsored by Commissioner Briggs. 
Thank you, Madam Solicitor. By this resolution, the Board of Commissioners approves the professional services agreement with Urban Design Ventures. <coughs> the purpose of the agreement is to create the county's CDBG five-year consolidated plan. The proposed agreement is attached to the resolution as Exhibit A. Resolution approval is required to approve an agreement in excess of $10,000 pursuant to Section 801.1 of the Administrative Code. Thank you. Sponsor comments. Commissioner Brace. This is a, a vendor that we've used for a couple of other services. It's a, um, to complete a um, plan that's required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, we can satisfy, this is a new vendor though for this particular function. We can satisfy with this vendor and other uh, capacities. Um, to the prior vendor, not as satisfied as we would like to be. Um, so the staff from BCD is available if we have any questions for them, but this comes with a positive recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Brace. Any other commissioner comments? Any public input? All those in favor of approving resolution 2018-61, please say aye. 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 Mr. Clerk, would you introduce the next resolution? Resolution 2018-62, approving an amendment to a professional services agreement with Urban Design Ventures LLC, sponsored by Commissioner Brace. Thank you, Madam Solicitor. By this resolution, the Board of Commissioners approves the amendment to the professional services agreement with Urban Design Ventures. The purpose of the amendment is to extend the contract for an additional year and to add the non-discrimination and the right to no provisions. Thank you. Commissioner Brace, would you like to add anything? Um, this is, I believe this is the final amendment under this particular uh, professional services agreement. Um, but that amendment includes uh, the non-discrimination language that Commissioner Zanelli and the county executive have worked to include in all our contracts and also some updated right to know request uh, language under the positive recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Grace. Any other commissioner comments? Any public input? All those in favor of approving resolution 2018-62, please say aye. 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 The resolution passes. On to our uh, First bill tonight, Mr. Clerk, will you introduce Bill 2018-28? Commissioner Bill 2018-28, approving a grant to the Leah County Housing Authority for a blighted property remediation program sponsored by Commissioner Brace. Thank you, Madam Solicitor. By this ordinance, the Board of Commissioners approves a grant to the Lehigh County Housing Authority. The county has received funds from the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency to partner with the Housing Authority for blight remediation. The amount of the grant is $100,000. Ordinance approval is required pursuant to Section 610 of the Administrative Code. Thank you. Sponsor Congress, Commissioner Brace. This is a, uh, an exciting opportunity. Um, for a couple of years, the Department of Community and Economic Development has uh, been convening a working group of uh, stakeholders that includes municipal officials and uh, nonprofit organizations to uh, work on uh, a county wide blight uh, task force and plan. And this particular grant uh, that we would be accepting and uh, uh, providing to the Lehigh County Housing Authority uh, helps to fulfill one of the goals of that plan, which is related to housing and blight remediation and uh, some of the municipalities that don't have redevelopment authorities and strong DCD functions in their municipal levels. Uh, so the Lehigh County Housing Authority would act as the agent uh, on this um, and we work with the with the, the uh, land trust to ensure that the properties once they've been rehabbed remain in affordable housing homeowner occupied status um, and this would create uh, uh, something of a revolving fund um, if the, the numbers work out right um, but it's it's exciting because this has been a few years in, in work and it shows goodness multi uh, multi-government uh, cooperation um, and engagement with our municipal officials. So DCD staff is here and available. The executive director from the, the Lehigh County has <coughs> another is available. This comes with a positive recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Grace. Any other com commissioner comments? Commissioner Zanelli. With the land restriction, I mean, to support this, I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. Mr. Clerk. Any other commissioner comments? Any public input? Commissioner Bill 2018-28 has had its first reading and scheduled for second reading and discussion and vote at our next meeting. 
Assembly Bill 2018-29. Would you introduce that bill, please, Mr. Clerk? Commissioner Bill 2018-29, adopting the 2019 Lehigh County budget and amending the job classification and pay plans for consistency with the 2019 budget. Sponsored by Commissioner Dyer. Thank you. Madam Solicitor? By this ordinance, the Board of Commissioners adopts the 2019 Lehigh County budget. The budget consists of Exhibits A, B, and C. The job classification and pay plan changes are set forth in Exhibit E. The proposed millage is 3.79, and the stabilization fund has a beginning balance of $25 million and a proposed ending balance of $19,551,912. Ordinance approval is required pursuant to Section 310 and 704 of the Home Rule Charter. Thank you. Sponsor comments? Commissioner Dockery? Yeah, so I hate to slow things down tonight. I do things so quickly, but uh, I am sure from uh, looking out at the audience, many people are here for this specifically. And as the solicitor mentioned, this is uh, $506.1 million. So it's something that uh, we cannot take very lightly. And the other part that wasn't mentioned is that this is raising the millage rate from 3.64 mills to 3.79 mills, which it was years ago to give uh, due credit to uh, the uh, county executive who said that uh, he's returning to the old millage rate. So uh, I am not going to say much more. We, we have uh, eaten this. Uh, we had hearings on September the 5th, September 11th, September the 17th, and uh, uh, everybody has had a chance to put in amendments for the, uh, the budget. So uh, let's jump into it. Thank you, Commissioner Dockery. We're going to move right into the amendments. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce amendment number one, please? Before I do that, Mr. Chairman, a couple of notes for the record. Um, this phrase applies to all amendments, so I'm going to read it in the record once, and it applies to them all. The proper officers and other personnel of the Head County are hereby authorized and empowered to take all such further action and execute such additional documents as they may deem appropriate to carry out the purpose of this budget amendment. Also, Mr. Chairman, um, copies of the amendments are on our table. They're on board docs. They've been shared with the administration, all commissioners, and the solicitor. So I'll not be reading each individual line on the record that we uh, entered in um, at this reference. And with that, Amendment 1 creates an employee recognition line item, a budget to the $25,000 adds to the general county budget, and it's funded by increasing the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund by $25,000. The details of the program will be worked out between the administration and the board of commissioners outside of the budget process. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Do we have a motion for amendment number one? I'm, I move that uh, we uh, address this amendment, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Commissioner Framis. I'll second. Second by Commissioner Zanelli. Sponsor comments, Commissioner Framis or Zanelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, where do we start? Well, at our very first budget hearing, uh, uh, Go to judicial records, start talking about the time when we handed out pins uh, for, our, for the anniversaries of our uh, employees. And we no longer do that. She said that we take the time, or we should take the time to write letters, and maybe we should. Uh, I maintain that the county uh, and its 2,000 or so employees uh, are our most important resource. And if they're this board's most important resource, they're the most important resource that fulfills the mission of our county, whether it's the uh, uh, fiscal office, whether it's Cedarbrook, whether it's Department of Preservation, whether it's a caseworker that has to go out in the middle of the night and address the concerns. Those individuals are worthy of recognition. So where do we start with that? Uh, I had discussions with uh, the controller's office to find out what would be considered de minimis, uh, how would we address things as far as uh, cash compensation and would there be uh, taxation that would have to apply as far as payroll taxes? 
and met with the, the Director of Human Resources, Judy Johnson, to find out where we used to be uh, in this particular uh, uh, of a program similar to this many years ago, and I think it was done away within 19, I mean 2002 or 2003, prior to the uh, infamous 70% tax cut. But it's time to revisit it again. Uh, I believe that uh, there's ways that we can address this beyond just the pins and the mugs. Uh, and doing my due diligence, I found that uh, uh, the state has a management directive that addresses many of the same concerns. Uh, that's put out by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania by the governor's office and addresses what we can and could do and what we should be doing in the forms of employee recognition and maybe even safety awards, which definitely have their roles for the IRS. Uh, I know that uh, looking even farther, there are companies that specialize in this. What really uh, constitutes a good employee recognition program is going to require some funding, and I think it's money that's well invested in our employees. There are outfits out there called Terry Berry, which do peer to peer evaluation and uh, recognition of, uh, on software. Uh, beyond the, the, the typical, what we think of as, you know, the parking place employee with money for the work. We have to make sure that something's meaningful. Uh, if you give somebody a $50 gift certificate for the time that they spent working X amount of overtime hours, you have to be careful that you're not saying what you've done is worth $50. So we have to be smart in what we do. But by the same token, we have to move forward and beyond. So there's, there's, there's two and a half billion people worldwide that have uh, technology like this in the palm of their hand. Okay? Uh, there's software out there for people that utilize that technology. And that's where we should be going. What, mean, what, what made the difference to employees in terms of recognition 30 years ago is not necessarily what makes a program that's there for us today. Little steps at a time. This board is not empowered to form any committees, but I think that's a line item that's worthwhile in, uh, looking at and approving and giving the county executive the authority to form a committee among the members of the, uh, 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 of the employee workforce of the county of Lehigh, of which I would hope some of the members of this board commissioners would uh, we step forward and, and come up with their ideas. Uh, certainly uh, management staff and individual work, workers in the workforce should be participating in this. So I think we should think outside the box. Something like this is going to cost money, but I think this is a good place to start. Thank you, Commissioner Brandes. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Osborne. Thank you, Chairman Nostein. Mark, I um, appreciate you taking a subject like this and raising it to this level. Um, I'll be supportive of this amendment. However, I have one, two requests. Actually, that our HR department is also involved in informing whatever incentives um, would be available to employees. And also make sure that it passes the muster of our solicitor's office. One, one of the concerns, I think, in, in the employee recognition or any kind of recognition plan is that we are fair and consistent and we have criteria that need to be met and then a reward or award that is commensurate with that. So um, those are all my thoughts at this time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Osborne. Any other commissioner comments? We have a question from Commissioner Holt. Commissioner uh, Graham, you mentioned that um, that the administration and the commission be working together on this, but I noticed some of the amendments are here listed how the administration will support, and this one doesn't. So is this something that the administration is committed to doing, to forming this committee, to um, implementing the ideas you just put forward? Or yes. maybe this is a question for the executive more appropriately, if you don't know the answer? I received positive feedback from members of the administration, but I will let the county executive address those concerns directly. <clears throat> the administration has always been in favor of any form of employee recognition, as we have done with the Lehigh County Iron Pigs, the two nights for our employees, uh, the Lehigh Valley Zoo, and we would definitely work with Mr. Grammis if the board would like this to go. We'd have no problem with that. We aren't on this because this was done before we actually got to talk to Mark. But 
So that's the only reason. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments or questions? Yes. Yeah, I, I have mixed uh, feelings on this because I feel we should recognize our employees, but I feel that the, this is coming before us as an undeveloped program. Uh, our employees are worthy of recognition, definitely. But I, I would rather see develop programs come before us rather than saying let's throw twenty-five thousand dollars into the city and uh, work something out afterwards. So I, I hope that you uh, bring forward more programs like this that we, we see a framework worked out ahead of time. I will reluctantly support this, but. Uh, just simply because we have such great employees. Thank you, Commissioner Dockery. Last call for Commissioner comments. Any public comments? All those in favor? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Didn't see you over there. I'm Rob Hopkins. I'm, uh, I'm a resident of the county and also a county employee. Uh, I do appreciate this very much. However, I would hate to see this take away from anything else that's more important in the county. Um, having a pin uh, isn't gonna mean anything to me if I can't eat, if I can't afford to do things. If you're gonna cut anywhere, this is not the place to spend money. $25,000 for a, a program that hasn't been vetted out. If it ever does happen, I would like to see rank and file employees involved in the process. Um, of, of what happens, because very often we're not listened to. Uh, we ride up in the elevator with, uh, with commissioners very often, and um, there's no communication, or very little. Um, I'd like to see the commissioners get more involved in what the rank and file employees actually do in their jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. <coughs> Any other public, public comment? Mr. Clerk, would you take a roll call vote on this, please? Roll call vote on Amendment 1. Commissioner Brace? Yes. Commissioner Brent? Yes. Commissioner Docker? Yes. Commissioner Grammis? Yes. Commissioner Nostein? Yes. Commissioner Hartson? Yes. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Commissioner Osborne? Yes. And Commissioner Zanelli? Yes. Nine in favor, Mr. Chairman, and none opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Would you introduce Amendment number 2, please? Amendment number 2 involves VFW uh, Post and American Legion funding. The motion is that uh, the following VFW post or American Legion post grant line items are increased by $200 to $500. That totals uh, $2,800 in increases, and it's funded by reducing the advertising line item by $2,800 to $7,200. Thank you. Do, I, do we have a motion on amendment number two? Motion to motion by Commissioner Zanelli. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Harsel. Sponsor comments? Randy Sinelli? Uh, in 2006, I really was, I looked at this line item, maybe 2004 for the first time when I was commissioner in my previous stint. Uh, and if you look at the budget, clearly, my fellow commissioners, there's also one line item in there for VFW posts that used to be on Hamilton Street in Allentown. We fought to get in there, and I think they disbanded. Uh, so that one dollar line item could probably be deleted along the line. However, even prior to that, speaking with some of the members, uh, post commanders and members of the local military uh, uh, posts, they would get two hundred dollars. That is two hundred dollars is not to buy flags for their veterans groups. This two hundred dollars uh, was basically to support our veterans groups uh, for the activities that they do while they're out placing these flags, which used to be twice a year on the graves of our, uh, our veterans. Uh, and also to support these particular groups when they participate in funerals, like we did for my fathers, uh, who had a military funeral, and for my father-in-law, who had a military funeral, and for my uncle, uh, and for my son's comrade over in Afghanistan. These people are out there at all these events. They participate in our, 
our parameters to participate in numerous various functions. So I think prior to that, it was $200. Uh, and that was 14 years ago, and we're still at $200, $300 rather. So I think it's due time that we uh, adjust that those particular line items for all those military posts that provide the services while peer wise. Even if it's just to have a luncheon for these individuals and all their affairs that they provide, services they provide for our county, uh, to raise that up to $500. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Grammis. Any other commissioner comments? Public input. All those in favor of approving amendment number two, please say aye. 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 Amendment passes. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce amendment number three? Amendment number three involves Task Force 99 Firefighters Grant. The motion as a line item for the Task Force 99 Firefighters Grant is budgeted at $13,750 and added to the emergency management budget. This is funded by increasing the transfer of the operating fund from the stabilization fund. And this amendment um, also states that with the approval of this motion, the board is also waiving this grant from the requirements of the Lehigh County Grants Policy. Thank you. Do we have a motion for amendment number three? So, um, motion by Commissioner Brown, second by Commissioner Grants. Second by Commissioner Grants. Any sponsor comments, Commissioner Grants or Janelli? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This particular group came before us, I believe, in August. Uh, there are 39 volunteers throughout the county from various fire departments. They generally provide their own equipment. Uh, they fall outside of the volunteer units that they normally go with. Uh, they're recognized by the county of Lehigh uh, as a fire department, if you would. However, they are a group of joint volunteers. So they fall in that unique middle status. Uh, they don't qualify for the normal state grant that would come from the operations funds for our fire department annually for $13,500. Uh, they really do protect so many citizens in the county, not only in the northern region, but in the southern part of the county, wherever there's a significant urban interface. And as more and more people move out of the city into the suburbs, closer to uh, mountainous areas, these individuals who volunteer their time uh, and are at severe risk because a wildfire uh, is significantly different than a structure fire, as we learned when they were here last time. They're actually out in the fuel itself. The trees can explode. It's a totally different situation. Uh, there was a film not too long ago which uh, documented the exploits of a, a true story uh, of a wildfire crew outside the state. And uh, these individuals, as a last resort, uh, sheltered themselves in what's called a fire shelter, which is the equivalent of a high intensity heat space blanket. Uh, this particular grant is asking for 20 of those. This group at this current point has none. Right? Uh, they would be $420 each, $8,400. They're looking for a specific pump, a lighter water pump, which is lighter than a regular firefighter pump, to get them back into the areas where they need to get at. And that would be one pump, Mark three, for $4,270. And lastly, part of the grant, 20 hard hats, black in nature, with a full brim for more protective services to combat the type of fire that they would encounter. $54 each uh, for a total of $1,080. Uh, I think that these men really demand our respect, and I think this is something that we can forward uh, uh, through a grant that would come uh, to emergency management, and that they would be reimbursed by another fire department. They would be purchased by another fire department, and the county would reimburse them, since they are not, uh, they are not uh, uh, registered as a uh, 501c3 nonprofit today, so they weren't able to provide a lot of the financial data that we would have under the normal grant process. That's why the waiver was requested. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Grammis. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Doherty. Yes, uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, support this one because I think it's setting a dangerous precedent when we start buying equipment for fire companies or other emergency management. I believe these people do a really fantastic job, but they are all members of different fire departments up in the northern part of the county. So the, the 
problem here is that uh, we, we are giving money to a group that's not recognized. That's why it does not uh, fall under the grant policy, and we have to give them a waiver there. So I, I cannot support it uh, because of that. Uh, before long, we'll have all the fire departments coming in and wanting us to buy equipment. Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Doherty. Uh, on, uh, on that, I, I think this is a great starting point to maybe having talks about regionalization of fire departments. <coughs> kind of wide thing. I would love to work with Scott Linden Youth and our and our Fire Chiefs Association to maybe start spurring talks. Maybe this is where we start talking about because of the volunteerism being low, uh, because of the funding being low. I think we spur talks about regionalization of fire departments uh, as a county whole. Thank you. Yes, if, if you uh, get on regionalization of fire departments, uh, you, you have me on board right away. But uh, until we reach that step, uh, I think it's uh, setting a bad precedent. Thank you. Commissioner Osborne. Chairman Nonsign, thank you. Um, Mark, do you know how this group of forest fire fighters are called into action? They're dispatched by, uh, I, I believe you just said, dis dispatch by our own crew. All right, they are, they are Fire Department Task Force 99, but it's recognized as Fire Department by the next one. Okay. I, I think that, in my mind anyway, resolves, at least temporarily for this year, the concern that we're, you know, that we're expanding the role and, and eliminating other people um, by including this. So thank you. If they are dispatched by our 911 system, then they're counted on to that's correct. Uh, just, Jim, if I just, I'll just add to that. Uh, Jim, uh, Mr. Docker, you, you mentioned that this really applies to just the volunteers from the North Department camp. There are, there are volunteers that participate in this force from Whitehall, which, depending on where you live, I, I don't really constitute Whitehall has been in North Department County. Uh, one of the, the largest areas of risk happens to be South Mountain. Mm -hmm. In fact, on, on this coming Sunday, the 14th, uh, they're having a demonstration uh, about urban interface of the Lehigh Gap Nature Center, if you would. But they're inviting specifically firefighters that would have to engage down in South Mountain. And they called them out all, all, over the, uh, all over the country. We just had one firefighter that went out to uh, fight the fire out uh, in, in the Midwest. Uh, and uh, it's specialized training. This is not a typical interior structural firefighter. These are specialized individuals that have to go through specialized training. Uh, and I think that we have to we should recognize it. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Bolton, we'll be here all night if you say like this. Um, I guess my concern with this, where then are they going to, I mean, they aren't in a recognized organization. Who's funds the support and maintenance of this equipment that they don't have now? They're not going to care for once they give it to them, where they're going to be able to store it and all that. I mean, how do they? they they, they maintain it themselves. They train independently uh, of other fire departments on their own. They have a trailer which was donated to them by Lehigh County Emergency Management, so most of their gear is in that. Other than that, they do maintain their gear in their own stations that, was, that is separate. If you go to Larry Station, for example, you'll see the gear of people that are on the wildlands firefighter force and their backpacks of all the equipment that they need stored in their lockers. Mr. Chairman, one procedural note. Um, if this amendment is approved and the grant policy is waived, then the county can work with them to use our procurement office and not have reimbursement. As long as they use the county's procurement policies, then we can purchase the equipment reference to rank. Any other commissioner procurement and any other commissioner comments? To get there, we need to public input. Joe Hillary, South Allentown. I don't know anything about this as far as merits of the expenditure of the policy. My question is more process oriented. Um, so the grants policy is way for this grant. As an advocate for that policy for quite a few years, and I'd like to thank the chairman for his leadership last year and the bipartisan unanimous vote last year to adopt it. Uh, what is the process here? Has this already been waived, or is this like a bomb at the last minute? And you have to decide two things to adopt the amendment and waive or I'm just a little at a loss here. I would defer to the clerk. 
I think they're part and parcel that in order for this grant to go to this organization based on the organization that they have in place, which is very limited, this uh, grant policy needs to be weighed and the county can be And I, I believe, Mr. Clark, that's a super majority. Is that six votes the way, or is it a simple majority? We can't remember the final language. Okay. Okay, but again, that whole policy is to kind of avoid this kind of stuff. Basically, it was they would apply, you know, to the spring or whatever, and then all this would be hashed out before the budget time. So maybe we have to address that policy again. Thank you. Commissioner Gray, you want to add anything? No. Any other public comment? I have comments. <laughs> My name is Naomi Wench, I live in Emmaus, and I live at the bottom of South Mountain, so I kind of appreciate um, what you just said there. How much is a life worth to you? 13700 bucks. what do you think? If it's my kid, my foster kid, I have five of them living on the bus, but face of South Mountain. Come on, come on, let's do this. Thank you. Any other public comment? All those in favor of approving amendment number three, you do signify by saying aye. Aye. No, and one no. <laughs> I'll have to call the roll. Call the roll. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Dyker? No. Commissioner Grammis? Yes. Commissioner Nostan? Yes. Commissioner Hartson? Yes. Commissioner Holtz? Yes. Commissioner Osborne? Yes. Commissioner Zanelli? Yes. And Commissioner Briggs? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I record eight votes in favor and one vote. Thank you. Moving along, Mr. Clark, would you please introduce amendment number four? Amendment number four. It involves line items that were cut in the coroner's budget during the uh, creation of the budget. The medical supplies line item is increased from 40, 000, from 40 to 45,000. Personnel development is increased from 10,000 to 15,000. And post mortem expense is increased from 655,000 to 670,000. And the transfer of the operating fund from the stabilization fund is the funding source. Thank you. Do we have a motion for amendment number four? So okay. motion by Commissioner Grace. Second. Second by Commissioner Osborne. Sponsor comments. Commissioner Osborne would like to add anything? Thank you, Chairman Osteen. Just then, you know, for a little bit of clarification for everyone in the audience, the, the coroner has in the last several years had to come back before the board asking for supplemental funding for the many crises that we have in our community, all of which are probably known by by everyone here. So this is a request that was made by the coroner during the budget hearings, and I agreed at that time to support it, sponsor it, and uh, close my thoughts to this email. Thank you, Commissioner Osborne. Any other commission comments? Commissioner Holt. I will say I'm a little confused by the amendment. Um, in the email we received from the coroner, he talked about how the death certificate expense line item had been removed and the money had to be returned because of state law and Act 122, but when I read the amendment, I do not see funding restored to that line item, and instead I see the post-mortem expense line item, which has not a list of original cuts at all, so I wasn't sure why the death certificate expense line item wasn't restored and why the post-mortem expense line item was added to be increased. And I just want to make sure that what was being requested was being done. Mr. Chairman, the cut was not made to death certificates, it was made to post-mortem expense. So then on the exhibit we received, because I went back and checked the exhibit, so that was incorrect on there? Correct. That was a, an earlier version. What came in the final budget was a cut to post-mortem expense rather than death certificates. The goal to reinstate the coroner's $25,000 then involved post-mortem expense line item rather than death certificates. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Any public comment? All those in favor of approving amendment number four, please signify by saying aye. 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 Amendment passes. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce amendment number five, please? Amendment number five of the Leeds Capital Projects for the Coroner's Office. Common Capital Projects and the other Capital Projects fund are deleted. Uh, vehicle replacement at 35,000 and a digital x-ray machine at 75,000. Um, these funds then uh, decrease the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund. And the intent is that an ordinance will be sponsored and the coroner and the administration will work uh, with the board and the law department to sponsor an ordinance to move these projects forward in the calendar of 2018. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Do we have a motion? 
So moved. Motion by Commissioner Dockery, second by Commissioner Holt. The sponsor comments? Sinelli, Holt, Dockery. This is uh, just uh, more or less moving it from the uh, next year's budget back into this year. So uh, it will, it's not a cut as such. It's just moving it between the years. Thank you, Commissioner Dockery. <laughs> Any other Commissioner comments? I just want to thank you know, for reinstating our thank you. Any other public comment? All those in favor of approving amendment number five, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And yes, Mr. Clerk, would you introduce amendment number six? Amendment number six involves court administration line item adjustments. And exhibit 6A to this amendment are the line item adjustments that are being requested uh, by the judiciary. Uh, there is no impact on the overall budget with these changes. Thank you. Do we have a motion for amendment number six? So moved. Second by Commissioner Dockery, second by Commissioner Grace. Sponsor comments? Osborne, Dockery, Grace, and Ellie. Uh, Chairman Elstein, only just for explanation to everyone in the audience, this again was an item that was brought up during the budget uh, hearings that we had, and um, it's something that we agreed to do. Thank you. And um, part of that conversation included um, a request by the courts that if the, uh, the, the budget targets can be met, because this does reflect a reduction in projected spending by the courts, that they would be coming back to us, and I guess the term would be without prejudice. Um, so and then let you know that if that does happen, I'll be happy to sponsor the appropriate legislation to amend the budget. Okay. Yeah, the, the court knows better how to uh, find him <laughs> its own budget than we do. Any other commissioner comments? Any public comment? All those in favor of approving amendment number six, please say aye. Aye. Amendment passes. Amendment number seven, please, Mr. Clerk. Amendment number seven involves the deletion of a position in general services. The motion is that a secretary two position in the emergency management budget is deleted. $38,106 um, is the amount, and that reduces the transfer to the operating fund for the stabilization fund. Thank you. Do we have a motion by Commissioner Holt? Second. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Snelli. Sponsor comments, Dr. Nicole Snelli. Um, this is just a cleanup item that was identified by the Director of General Services during budget year. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Any public comments? All those in favor of approving Amendment Number Seven, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Amendment passes. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce Amendment Number Eight, please? Yes, for Amendment Number Eight, Mr. Chairman, we'll introduce Amendment Eight to get it on the record and then immediately uh, go to the amendment uh, to it. So amendment number eight, the main amendment, um, moves that $5,970,000 of capital projects, and they're detailed on the amendment. The, soar, the funding source for those has changed from the operating fund to financing, and as such, the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund is decreased by $5,970,000. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Dockery, second by Commissioner Hart to sponsor comments. Well, before we do that, Mr. Chairman, I'd recommend that now we jump into the amendment. And the amendment to this amendment adds two additional projects. That would be funding source would be changed from the operating fund to financing. Uh, they're detailed on the amendment. They total $400,000. Uh, building and infrastructure systems food services, one at Cedar Brook and one at Cedar Brook Fountain Hill. Thank you. Do we have a motion on amendment to amendment number eight? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Holt. Second. Second by Commissioner Hartzell. Sponsor comments to the amendment. Commissioner Holt. Um, yeah, it was my understanding we were looking to um, move eligible projects to financing and I believe these two projects fit that criteria. Um, there are no other projects that are proposed in the 2019 capital budget, which I think should be financed, and I think the appropriate time to discuss that is here during the budget hearing. Um, the one is relating to buying an HVAC chiller for the Mountain Hill facility, and the other relates to um, 
by purchasing Cedar Brook food service equipment, which would have a useful life of over 15 years. And that particular project in past capital plans was proposed for financing. And so I don't see why there would be any objection when it was originally pro proposed for financing to finance it at this time. Thank you, Commissioner Holt. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Zanelli. Uh, I guess I just want to clarify, I'd really like to hear from um, Rick or someone else in the administration their opinion on this. Um, and I'm just slightly confused because, you know, I do appreciate that we were given a budget or at least a capital plan that showed just how poorly we would be off if we did everything in cash and now we're going back to doing some very smart financing, which I support. But I do want to know the details about these two specific projects and if the administration supports. Commissioner Rick Mulchaney, Director of General Services. Um, <laughs> Commissioners, this has been a, uh, an experience for us all. Uh, we moved uh, projects from the capital plan that was presented originally from financing to cash. We moved those projects back to financing. Uh, and then our plan right now this evening before you is to amend Amendment 8 to include more projects when I was simply asked for a few months time, maybe two months, and allow me to review the capital plan and the budget and return to this board uh, through the executive and provide you a plan that we can absolutely objectively review all of the projects to make a decision on how best to manage our cash flows in 2019 and beyond. So commissioners, I think there's really no need this evening. What is a need is the original Amendment 8. I support, the executive supports Amendment 8. I think the amendment to Amendment 8 should really be delayed and allow me an opportunity to recraft and come before this board again uh, with a plan that may be amended and our budget amended for 2019. Um, I would want to just run into some hand-picked projects because I believe there could be more projects that also meet the kind of qualifications required for us to do financing. Uh, while maintaining, uh, not simply just financing a 20 or 30 thousand hour item. So commissioners, I think uh, we accept uh, Amendment 8. We think it's smart. Uh, we think it helps us balance our, our budget. Uh, but Amendment to Amendment 8, I would ask that you vote no and allow me some time uh, to revisit this with you at a future time. Thank you, Mr. Mulchain. Any commissioner no, comments? Commissioner, uh, commissioner Holt. Um, I'll, I'll just respond to that. I, I don't think that passing this proposed amendment, adding these two projects in prevents us from having a future conversation. And I'm confused if one of the projects was originally scheduled for financing, why the administration would object to at this time adding it to financing. The one project totals um, $335,000 in total, um, up with a portion of schedule for this year. The other project totals, I think it was $500 and some thousand, and yeah, $525,000 in total, a portion of which was scheduled for this year. Um, it doesn't, I haven't heard an objection that these two projects are inappropriate for financing. I mean, the one had been proposed for financing in the past, particularly, um, and so I don't see the harm in moving these two projects for financing at this time and then still being able to do a further review down the road and have the conversation you're talking about. I don't view those things as um, mutually exclusive. I think we can do both. I think we can approve these and still have a conversation. Commissioner mm -hmm. Dougherty? Yes, um, I, I will, uh, I'm willing to go along with uh, Mr. Mulchaney on this one. Uh, using the, the feeling that if something has to be changed later on, if he wants to put this into financing, he can come back to the finance committee and we can amend the budget. So uh, it, it, it's not all over. And part of the confusion, many people are out there not knowing what's going on now, we uh, turned many of these projects into capital. We wanted to pay our bills without running up our county credit card. 
But then we did a five-year plan after that, and we saw that uh, by not financing, we were going to run into several problems in the five-year plan. So it may not be uh, drastic next year, but within three, four, five years, it may be a problem. So I had a, a meeting with uh, uh, Mr. Mulchaney and Tim Reeves, and uh, we came up with uh, the, the list that's uh, here of the capital projects that are put back into financing. So I will be supporting that. Thank you, Commissioner Dockery. Commissioner Osborne. Thank you, Chairman Gunstein. Um, I personally don't see this as a topic worthy of being a flashpoint. Um, there is no commitment that any projects that are listed for potential financing actually will ever be financed. In addition to that, when we do go out for financing, there may be projects, and I would expect there would be some, in the 2020, perhaps the 2021 <coughs> capital plan that would be reasonably and justifiably lumped into this group as well when we do that. So I'll support the amendment because I just don't see any harm in including it right now. That discussion can still be had when the time comes. Thank you, Commissioner Osborne. Any other commissioner comments? Any public comment on amendment to amendment eight? Joe Lake of South Allentown. My comments apply to the amendment to the amendment and the amendment which might be amended or the, which may not be amended. I think I got that right. Um, yeah, there seems to be great confusion here. Um, to Commissioner Zanelli, I never advocated moving totally to all cash. You're not going to fill renovate Cedarbrook with a check. That's an appropriate borrowing. Just like 99% of people don't buy a house with cash. You take out a mortgage. That's called sensible long-term debt. I heard a very encouraging thing from Mr. Mulchaney saying you don't move a $30,000 item into the financing. Yeah, I remember an $18 million bond a year or so ago where we bought lawnmowers that might last 10 years. So as we got to nail down this process, look, it's small, medium, large expenditures. And then it's routine and non-routine. That's your matrix. Obviously, the routine, small expenditures, you don't whip out a credit card for. I just talked at the committee meeting about how our debt payments are drastically going down. That does free up a lot of cash. That's the benefit of moving to cash and carry. I mean, who, who buys their uh, groceries or pays their rent with a credit card and, and takes 20 years to pay off that one payment? And you do it every month? I mean, come on, that, that's ridiculous. So nobody's advocating an either or, okay? The financing makes sense in certain situations. I would argue even roof repairs. Why do you, why do you borrow money for a, a roof that needs to be replaced every 10 or 15 years? That can be mapped out. So this is going to involve a bigger process, but I am hearing some good talk because I've been advocating this for four years. Stop whipping out the credit card because it frees up a lot of cash. So um, I, I would recommend this, especially if there's a room to talk and shift things around later anyway. Frankly, if these aren't quote unquote approved, well, I guess you have to put them in the budget anyway, but I mean, so you can eliminate most of the supposed budget deficit by just taking these off the budget and negotiating with the capital plan at some point, but whatever. But I, I would definitely do both and just free up the flexibility to deal with it later. Because again, you have to move towards cash and carry. You don't finance a $20,000 thing with a 30 year bond. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any other public comment? Mr. Clerk, can we get a roll call vote on the amendment to Amendment 8, please? Commissioner Dockery? No. Commissioner Grammis? No. Commissioner Nostein? Yes. Commissioner Hartzell? No. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Commissioner Osborne? Yes. Commissioner Zanelli? No. Commissioner Brace? No. And Commissioner Brown? No. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I recorded three votes in favor and six votes opposed. Amendment to Amendment 8 fails, so we're going to go to Amendment 8. We'll go back to Amendment 8 that was introduced by Commissioners Dockery and Hartzell. And again, this is the original list, $5,970,000 no, $5, of capital projects moved from the operating fund to financing. And you can entertain comments, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner comments on amendment number eight. Make public comment on amendment number eight. All those in favor of approving amendment.
Amendment number eight, please say aye. 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 Amendment number eight passes. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce amendment number nine, please? Amendment number nine involves the Department of Development's one dollar line items. Uh, exhibit 9A attached to the amendment lists 27 one dollar line items that are all deleted. Thank you. So we have a motion for amendment number nine. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Holt, second by Commissioner Doherty. Sponsor comments, Commissioner Zanelli and Commissioner Holt. Um, during the budget hearings, this is something that was discussed. Um, the one dollar line items have been problematic in the past, and it was identified that there would be no harm in deleting these. The board has passed similar cleanup amendments like this last year and in the past, and it has not appeared to cause issues. Most of these were one time allocations or allocations that ended in the year 2018. Thank you. Any other sponsor comments? Any other commissioner comments? Any public comment? All those in favor of approving amendment number nine, please say aye. 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 Amendment number nine passes. Amendment number 10, please, Mr. Clerk. Amendment number 10 involves the vacancy factor. Uh, four vacancy factor line items are each increased by $25,000. Uh, with that, the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund is decreased by $100,000. And there's a note that Commissioner Holt based this amendment on historical data on the vacancy factor provided by the fiscal office. Thank you. We have a motion for amendment number 10. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Holt. Second. Second by Commissioner Osborne. Any sponsor comments? Um, in talking with the fiscal office about this, by using rounding, the vacancy factor would calculate to be $900,000, but when they didn't round, it would be $1 million. Looking at the historic data, it has never been below the actual vacancy factor in the operating fund has never been below $1 million since two, uh, 2012. An average has been 1.3, the highest it's been is 1.8. So this amendment is to simply match what the actual unrounded number is. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. Any other commissioner comments? I didn't want to say I'm inclined to, to support this amendment. Um, I, I, I do have some concerns that we try and get our budgeting, you know, especially as it impacts the stabilization fund, to be close to accurate as we can possibly be, understanding that the vacancy factor is an estimate by itself. Um, you know, I, I think this is on the, the, the yeah. conservative side of an estimate, even with this amendment. Um, so I'm, I'm inclined to go along with it, um, recognizing that the course of the year when you have vacancies just because you can't hire as quickly as the vacancy occurs. So it's uh, the, the, the wheels of government and hiring can be difficult sometimes. Thank you, Commissioner Grace. Any other commissioner comments? Any public input? All those in favor of approving amendment number 10, do you see the five say aye? Aye. Amendment 10 passes. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce amendment number 11, please? Amendment number 11 involves the deletion of a position in the county executive's office. Uh, the motion is that the following position is deleted in the office of the county executive. Clerical specialist, employee number 22537, uh, cost 44117 With that, the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund is decreased by $44,117. Thank you. Do we have a motion for amendment number 11? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Dockery, second by Commissioner Holt. Sponsor comments? Commissioner Dockery, your Holt. Yes, uh, this is one of those one dollar positions that was mentioned earlier no. from last year's budget. No, not this one. Not this one. This, this is the clerical specialist position that's uh, filled in the oh. executive's budget. Okay. Uh, this is, this is um, a position that had been previously in the executive budget and at the time, it doesn't seem like the appropriate to add, add this in. Okay, Commissioner Holt, any other commissioner comments? Any public comment? Yeah, I, I, I was, as the executive makes this way over, um, you know, the, the, the county executive's office is not, uh, it's interesting because we look at the administration, and there's several departments that are um, overseen by the county executive. And the county executive has a responsibility for oversight department heads, so on and so forth. 
What's um, interesting is when you take a look at the total uh, capacity of the county executive's office, it's um, uh, a lot smaller than people might expect. Uh, and I think that the position that was included in the office in the budget this year um, still keeps that budget, or keeps that office perhaps at the, the lowest um, number of employees support employees working directly for an elected official. I mean, I can the potential exception to that is the commissioner's office, where we only have two employees working for us. You know, the county executive has responsibility over a significant operation, and a significant operation requires support. He has department heads that are incredibly gifted and talented, who have employees, or support employees who are incredibly gifted and talented. I think um, the executive including this in the budget, uh, to me it feels appropriate. I, you know, I, I don't know how we want to quantify uh, its appropriateness over you know, justifying other positions, but to me this, this doesn't feel like a, a very significant ask for uh, supporting the chief executive officer of the county. Any other commission comments? I'll, I'll just say um, it was one of the positions that was increasing the overall count the I guess, new positions, if you want to call like that. One of the positions that was increasing to me, the overall uh, number of positions in the, uh, our workforce. Right, I, I mean, there's a context that I can give. This year, prior to this position being moved into the county executive's office, the personnel for the county executive's division was $181,000 in expenditures. The uh, personnel line for the commissioners was $337,000. So you know, when we're taking a look at what's appropriate for the chief executive officer, I think it's fair that his personnel line item be kind of similar to ours. Um, and even with this addition, I believe it's still underneath that person. I don't think I can support this cut either, mostly because I think the, look, we don't just give the executive anything he or she wants, we're the check and balance on, on the executive. But I think um, Executive Armstrong, is, you know, most recently elected, does deserve some leeway for this, for this kind of position. It's a pretty inexpensive spot, and um, so I, I, would, I would prefer to give him this leeway, certainly at least for another year. Commissioner Osborne. Thank you, Chairman Elstein. Um, our executive is at the podium now, and I'd like to hear, actually, the, the reason and justification for it um, before I make any kind of judgment. Thank you, Commissioner Osborne. <coughs> Excuse me, Madeline Nicole. Uh, I don't want to get into a personnel issue. Uh, I was kind of surprised with this amendment because we were in front of the board several months ago, and I thought we worked out a, a very good compromise, took this position from being one position, which was in the past budgets at 62,000, and we turned it into a specialist clerical position, but kept pretty much, not pretty much, we kept all of the jobs the same. We reduced the salary 30 some percent. Um, the person that's in that position has been working very, very hard. I think it's important that we realize we have 2,003 employees in the county. And I don't know of any business that would have 2,000 employees that wouldn't have somebody that was dealing with public information. And I think it's very, very important for the county and from some of the projects that we've been doing and want to do going forward that we have this position. We wouldn't put it here if we didn't think it was important. And I would appreciate your support on this. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong, I'll, I'll say this. When we asked uh, Executive Armstrong, Executive Armstrong, uh, when we asked this employee to present to us his accomplishments, he was a no-show to this board of commissioners. Um, I don't think that sat well with certain commissioners as well. And I also recall and I'm going to ask, was this job ever posted? 
this particular job right here? No. no. Do we interview anybody else for this no. particular job? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Nostein. Now I understand what this topic is about, um, so I appreciate the explanation. I'm not aware of the significant volume or significance at all of the product of this particular position. So now that I understand what this is about, I, I'm prepared for it. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would just like to be very frank about this. I think this amendment is very much stepping outside the wheelhouse of what we're supposed to do. And administration and personnel falls under our executive. So I will not support this. Commissioner Dockery. Yeah, th this is a, a position that was sneaked into the budget without uh, our having any input. And as the county executive just mentioned, it was not advertised. This is a personal public relations person for the county executive. That can be considered uh, very political, in my opinion. So uh, I, I cannot support keeping the person on the way. Commissioner Gravis. I, I would like to go on record that uh, I'm dismayed that we would use the budget process to address personnel deficiencies. I think that regard falls within the auspices of the appropriate county manager. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to make my thoughts known on that and also the fact that we've addressed this in and out how many times. And I can remember Commissioner Marshall saying, you know what? This was fine. Let's move on. Let's give this chance, person a chance to succeed. I don't see this man in the debt. I don't see this. I see a position in the line item. But I have, I have a manager that values his work, that sees his work every day, or her work every day. And I think that we ought to remind that person to make those decisions and not to move forward through the budget process to eliminate a position based on whatever wrong way it might have been. That's past. Let's just move on. So that's my thought. Well, I utterly disagree with Commissioner Dougherty's characterization of a personal PR role. But he is right. He was slipped into the budget in not a good way. And that was discussed by this board at the time. But I, I still, that's the leeway that I think. It's one position. The executive, the elected executive thinks it's very important. And I, that goes a long way with it. Mr. Marshall, uh, Commissioner Meltzer, you're absolutely right. It is important. I think we all uh, agree that it is something that we need to, to have. But uh, the the person in that position and not being uh, uh, sent out for uh, interviews, and there's other people I think can do a better job. That's, that's just my opinion. One, as we heard, we have how many employees? 2,000 employees? 2003. 2003. I'd like to know how many of those 2003 employees had to come before the board to justify their existence. I feel this is unfair treatment and opens us up to litigation. Uh, and I also feel that we are just that. I'll leave it there. How was that? The 2,000 employees, they've all had job interviews and jobs were posted. That was well. not for this. It, that was not under this executive, and most importantly, we closed the loophole that enabled this to be, quote, stuck in. We just did it. We just passed the amendment that deleted all these one dollar positions. To me, that's enough. Commissioner Dockery. Yes, uh, this is a, a previous position that past administrations had, and they dissolved the position because they thought it was unnecessary. Thank you. Any public comment? My name is Joyce Moore, and I'm from Upper Milford Township. I speak in support of this position. I think it's, it smells that you'd want to eliminate this position. I'm not going to say why, but you know why. And I am fiercely upset by this motion. Any yeah, other comment? Maybe <laughs> <laughs> trip. Um, my name is Naomi Wench. I'm from Atlanta, Pennsylvania. 
Um, I just want to say that um, this county elected Bill Armstrong to be our county executive. And he needs this guy. And this, uh, from my understanding, we aren't talking about the guy, right? We're not talking about the person here. We're just talking about the job. So deal with that on another level. This position is obviously needed and warranted. Keep the position. If you have another issue, deal with it in a different way. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comment? Mr. Clerk, will you take a roll call vote, please, on amendment number 10? I'm sorry, amendment number 11. Commissioner Grammis? No. Commissioner Nostan? Yes. Commissioner Hartzell? No. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Osborne? Yes. Commissioner Zanelli? No. Commissioner Brace? No. Commissioner Brown? Yes. And Commissioner Dockery? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I recorded five votes in favor and four votes opposed. Thank you. Amendment passes. Please introduce amendment number 12. Amendment number 12 involves a position deletion in general services. It moves that the following position is deleted in the Iowa Cultural Land Preservation Budget. The conservation Program Specialist at salary of $46,342. Uh, it increases the part-time employees line item in that budget by $23,000 to $89,635. And the transfer of the operating fund from the stabilization fund is reduced by twenty three thousand three hundred and forty two. Thank you. Do we have a motion for amendment number twelve? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Dockery. Is there a second? Second, second by Commissioner Hull. Yes. Sponsor comments? Dr. Dear Hull? Yes. Uh, this uh, may seem strange to some people since I have been uh, one of the leading advocates of farmland preservation. But um, I feel that uh, as a previous position that we discussed, adding to the complement in the county it is not good. We shouldn't be uh, uh, expanding government. And in terms of farmland preservation, my only thought here is I think we should become more effective at doing the job. And uh, we should be using computers more, we should be using GIS more, we shouldn't be doing as many field inspections as we have been doing in the past. So based on that, uh, I don't think it is uh, necessary to uh, uh, expand the complement out there. Although I, I realize that we have a new person in charge out there and she's still feeling her way through. But, uh, uh, and uh, I have been told that we should have someone else in there full time to uh, have a succession plan. I, I, I agree that would be a good aspect, but uh, I, I still cannot support adding a full time position there. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? I'm, I'm confused. How do we have a succession plan? with a full-time person when we're eliminating the full-time position. Mm -hmm. Well, that Mr. I said Mr. 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 it's an argument for a full-time position. I, I will say, I, I think funding a full-time position, additional full-time position is needed. We made a significant investment in the Department of Preservation in this county. It's a great quality of life initiative. Um, we got to keep it rolling, and they need help there. I chair that, that board, and I think they would be very grateful if we fund this position and have two full-time people. Chris Osborne, Chairman Nelson. Thank you. Um, actually, the, the two people, the commissioners anyway, who I um, know are invested in farmland preservation, um, I just heard from them. So, um, I am a little surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I am a little surprised, uh, Commissioner Dockey, that you're against this. But it, it, you know, it's intrigued me actually. So I think before I make up my mind, if we um, maybe turn the floor over to Rick Volchini, it will help me decide what to do here because I, I'm confused. <laughs> 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 Commissioners, I, I, um, I stood before you a year ago and was chided by this board for not bringing a full-time position onto the um, farmland preservation team. 
Um, I asked you at that time to let me evaluate uh, our new appointed director of farmland preservation. We had a change in the leadership at the Sterling Raver Farmland Preservation Board. We had um, all part-time force. And what I propose this year is reducing uh, part-time hours and labor to accommodate for adding a full-time position that will add to some consistency uh, in our attempts to manage uh, the farmland preservation uh, department. We're proud of uh, over 300 farms, um, over 23,000 acres. Uh, we have an investment in 2019, a huge investment again. We're looking at 25 more farms uh, next year. So I do believe there is a track record of need. And Commissioner Doherty, I would uh, express to you that um, I know that you support this. And I'm asking you tonight to reconsider your support for this amendment and allow me to hire that second individual. <coughs> Commissioners, I can't talk much more about it. I'm surprised I'm even asking, I've been asked to talk about it at all. Rick, uh, you're very convincing, and uh, <laughs> along with the argument that you gave me earlier in this, I, I will change my position. I, I know this is very important. And uh, Rick's the one who mentioned succession planning to me, and I, I think that's important. And as long as this uh, position is uh, advertised nationally, or however it is, and uh, we get someone good into this position, I am willing to change my mind and support it. Thank you. So I will withdraw. Unless there's other comments that would be made about it, I will withdraw my second. Yep, yeah. withdraw second. Sounds like. Do you want to withdraw the motion? Withdraw. Amendment number 12 has been withdrawn. Very celebrated. Good job. Glad to have you done that. Good job. Uh, I think it it just shows that the administration can work with the commission. <laughs> <laughs> uh, At least one of us. Mr. Clark, please introduce amendment number 13. Amendment number 13 involves the funding source for the Lehigh County Historical Society contract. Uh, there's a line item for that contract, and the funding source is changed from the operating fund to the hotel tax fund. With that, the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund is decreased by 96000 $96,000 transfer from the hotel tax fund is added, uh, I'm sorry, a transfer from the hotel tax fund of $96,000 is added to the general county budget. Thank you. Do we have a motion for amendment number 13? Second. Motion by Commissioner Doherty, second by Commissioner Holt. Uh, sponsor comments? Commissioner um, Doherty, your hold. Yeah, this contract, we, uh, this line item has a contract with the Lehigh County Historical Society, and the contract really is all about promoting tourism at several key Lehigh County historic landmarks, such as the Sailor Cement Museum, the Laundry Turnip Museum, the Haynes Mill Museum. And so as such, it would be more appropriate to be funding this from the hotel tax, which is there to help promote tourism. When you read over the services that they're providing for us, um, they are ensuring that we have staffing there, they're promoting the museum, they're marketing and educational programs, they're cooperating with state and, state and local governments to promote tourism, um, and working on, you know, marketing, branding, and public tours promoting Lehigh County history. And so this seems to be a for that. Thank you, Chairman Um this, along with a couple other amendments that are on the agenda this evening, I will support this, but I, I would like to make a comment. And it's the use of hotel tax dollars, and I have some concerns about the use of other funding line items. Um, hotel tax dollars are supposed to also pay for Iron Pig Stadium. Mm -hmm. 
And there's going to be some time, unless we watch ourselves here, where we're now not going to have enough in the in that fund, hotel tax fund. And if and when that time comes, we'll be using straight out county tax dollars to fund Iron Big Stadium. That was never the original intention. So I I, I don't have a problem supporting the ones that are, are pulling from the hotel tax, but I also would like the administration to help us as a board understand the trajectory that we're placing ourselves on. Now, the justification for taking hotel tax dollars to fund this and other things, I also would like to have, within reason, some accounting of, you know, we took $96,000 out of the fund, but we got 120000 back in hotel tax dollars because of this. So I guess I'm looking for some return on our investment, knowing that if we don't have that, we're setting ourselves up for a scenario that down the line, and I don't, it's certainly going to be within the next 10 years. Uh, and we're going to second guess ourselves. Richard Dockery, then Commissioner Grace. Yes, uh, we, we have a, a healthy balance in that fund right now, and we were thinking in terms of taking that out. It, this is supposed to, you know, tell us is supposed to be used for hotel nights and so forth to attract people. And we find that the historical society does attract people from out of town, so it's a good use. But I agree with you that we are going to have problems later on in terms of the baseball field. We have a healthy balance now, but we're thinking at the present time it, it's better to take this out of the hotel tax money rather than out of the stabilization fund. Let's keep the stabilization fund as full as we can. And all the way at the end of the amendments, there is one amendment that's going to have a lot of discussion, but that money, it will, in the last amendment, will go back into the hotel tax fund and be available for uh, any repairs at the uh, baseball stadium or uh, uh, in terms of whatever comes up out there. Commissioner Bryce. So my concern about this particular line item isn't the, the fund balance of our hotel tax uh, funds, although it is something, as Commissioner Osborne raises, is something that we should be uh, mindful of for any of these types of amendments. Um, I view the service that the Historical Society is providing as a service that is in lieu of county functions, and I don't think it's wise for us to pull from the hotel tax funds to pay for what I think are fundamental county services. Um, if, if we were going to be, uh, if we did this in-house, I think it would be just, I, I think that the, the, the industry that generates the hotel tax dollars would have a legitimate complaint if we were to fund this internally. By saying that we're funding an organization to do this, I, I think we're just bypassing the, 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 the point of the intended use of hotel tax dollars. I will say that yes, it promotes tourism, and periodically county government exists to help promote tourism. Um, you know, this is, this particular contract, however, I don't think is, is the right one to fund out of hotel tax dollars um, because they're functioning on our behalf. They're not functioning to, to generate tourism in another fashion. Thank you, Commissioner Brace. Any other Commissioner comments? <coughs> Commissioner uh, I agree with Commissioner Brace. I won't be supporting this. I believe that this is the inroad to our Amendment 22, which cuts over $27,000 from the arts, and I think we all know for society we have to have a worthy investment in the arts, so I will not support this whatsoever. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Public input? Public comment? Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, Tim Reese, fiscal officer. Every year we do uh, a projection of this fund, um, starting with the beginning balance and rolling forward the yearly increases that we expect to bring in and compare that to the debt structure. I will say that the debt structure is, is, is back-end loaded. 
We're at about $500,000 a year. In a few years, that ramps up to a million, to a million five, and by the end, you know, up to a million six. Um, so the current analysis that we did, and, and I think you remember that we increased the amount of capital that we pay out of this fund for the Coca-Cola Park from 100,000 to 250,000. With that analysis and the debt structure in place as it is today, we have $14,000 remaining at the end of the cycle of this. Um, so if we do, uh, to point a phrase from my mom, pay Rob Peter to pay Paul, um, we are going to be taking money from this year that will ultimately be needed later on. Now, is that doable? Of course it's doable. My reservation to that is I meet with the General Purpose Authority who every year ask me, do we have enough money in the hotel tax fund to meet our debt structure? And up until this point, the answer has been yes. If we do this, the answer will have to be no. Thank you, Chairman Osline. Um, Tim, can you help me understand what you just said? You mentioned fourteen thousand dollars left after this cycle. Yes. What what cycle are you referring to? The debt cycle of, on on the Coca-Cola Park. And when is that? Two thousand thirty-seven. So okay. So yeah. You're saying in two thousand and thirty-seven, the trajectory we're on yeah. is going to be problematic. Yes. Okay, it's yeah. actually it's a little bit further out than I thought. Well, the problematic part is is if the 96 were to continue every year from here out, then by about 2030, we would hit a negative spot. Yes, I, I think that's what you And that's why I know it's hard to quantify, but that's why I said, I, you know, we almost, if we're going to do this, we should have some mechanism to determine an ROI. Are we putting back what we just took out? And if that's the case, then it's a good investment. If it's not, we're setting ourselves up for Commissioner Dockery, thank you. Notice this is at the, the end of that period. Uh, the, this is just intended for this year's budget to see us through and to keep the stabilization fund uh, fully funded. Yeah, Glen Eckhart County Controller. Um, the one advantage that we've had over the last three years, since the state formula for the NIS has been changed, the hotels now have, in, within the NIS, have to pay into the NIS, that sales tax. Uh, for the last three years, that has not happened because there has been no money given to help fund that. Um, with Americus and the other one down here, uh, those, that, those funds could easily be taken out of the county's pocket in the future, which would, which now is artificially higher because those taxes have gone directly back to us. So those would be as much as three or four hundred thousand dollars a year. That's now where we've been the last couple of years. From the NIS that's gone back in here, that may stay in the NIS as the Americas and the new hotel is uh, worked on. Any questions on that? Does it make any sense? Any other commissioner comments or public comment? Mr. Clerk, would you take a roll call, please, on amendment number 13? Commissioner No Stunt. No. Commissioner Hartzell? No. Commissioner Holt? Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Osborne? Yes. Commissioner Zanelli? No. Commissioner Briggs? No. Commissioner Brown? No. Commissioner Doherty? Yes. And Commissioner Grammis? No. Mr. Chairman, I reported three votes in favor and six votes opposed. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce amendment number 14? Amendment mm -hmm. number 14 deletes the communities that care line item in the economic community development fund. That line item was $30,000. And with the deletion of that line item, Fund balance of the Economic Community Development Fund is increased accordingly. Thank you. Do I have a motion for amendment number 14? So moved. Motion by Commissioner Brown. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Holt. Sponsor comments, Commissioner Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just real quick, uh, the communities that care uh, came to us in one of our budget hearings and um, presented at this time. Uh, I just feel that uh, I think it's a great cause. I think it uh, has uh, substance, uh, but the uh, 
Uh, the Communities I Care is not uh, organized yet. It's moving towards that organization uh, to work with other schools, uh, uh, especially up north, the Whitehall School District, the Northern Lehigh School District, and, and one other place. So I would like to see the other school districts come on board, maybe by them uh, chipping in maybe 10000 each to get to that $30,000 mark that they're looking for. Thank you, Craig Brown. Any other questions or comments? I love that, um, and we've heard about this at great length during the uh, budget hearings, and it just doesn't seem to have really quite to the level of, of a county-wide initiative yet. And um, I think that that's important that we're going to be doing we're really considering the county-wide impact of them, and um, it doesn't seem like the schools are necessarily all on board with this, and that's just kind of the not behind the board. Thank you, Commissioner Holt. Any other commissioner comments? Any public comment? Frank Kane, Director of Community and Economic Development. I would just like to say that, you know, even in a even in a tough budget year, this is one thing that the county executive has asked for. And I've heard tonight many times, you know, I've heard a few say that, you know, you think it's fair to, you know, give to, to give something. And I mean it's the one I think it's kind of the one thing or one of the few things that, 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 that you just mentioned over and over again. And, in the counties and, and you know speeches this year, and it's a prototype. It's not fully fleshed out yet. It's a prototype, and the money doesn't have to be spent. You know, if we don't if we don't establish a contract that, that you would then vote on that. I, I, I think that I mean, you, know, you just you just had a you just discussed the line item for twenty five thousand dollars for employee uh, recognition. There's a small enough amount of this budget that I think we could put it in and come up with a plan and not spend the money that we have on our building. Okay. I was going to mention that as well. I also spoke with uh, Commissioner Holt to see if we could leave the $30,000 in the budget as opposed to the $1, which at the time she was amenable to. I believe it is a good program. I believe it is a worthy investment. Um, I will not support to leave this from the budget. Thank you, Phyllis Armstrong, County Executive. And throughout my campaign, running for county executive, I explained the Community to Cares program. It did start in Whitehall, and uh, I was a part of that. And through the Penn State Extension, we realized what this program could do to change things. We're talking tonight about a 500,000 grand because of the opioid problem. This is one of the few programs anywhere in the state of Pennsylvania that goes to prevention. It doesn't go to what do we do after this problem happens? What do we do with the addicts? What do we do with the crime? What we do in this program is bring an entire community together, one community at a time, and, and you're absolutely right, it's, it's got to grow. We definitely, but the school districts have to allow it, and for it to grow, it has to go through a test. We have to, take a survey among the students, they have to fill out the questionnaires, and sometimes we found that certain school districts don't want to do that because then you would have to see that here's the reality of what's going on. But when you realize what's going on, then you bring your community leaders together, political, school, uh, everybody, parents, students, we have a, the drug and alcohol people, the probation people from Lehigh County working with us in this program. And it's a model. And it's a model that we hope could go someplace. And the fact that it, it you know, I know $30,000 is a lot of money. I'm not going to say that that's just a little bit. It is a lot of money. But for 30000 if we could prevent, and we found through this program, for every one dollar we have spent in the program so far, we have saved taxpayers nine dollars down the road. And we have statistics and surveys and data to prove that. So I think it's time we stop looking at what do we do once these problems happen and take a program that says, what can we do to prevent these problems from happening? And if 30000 is an investment, will it be a guarantee? I have no idea. Have we seen it work 
in Catastopha, we're putting it northern Lehigh, Whitehall, we're trying to Salisbury, we're trying to expand it, and that's the cost. And we are combining with Penn State on this program. This is their program, basically, and we're just becoming part of it. And I would appreciate if you consider it. Thank you. Any public comment? Commissioner Brace, you want to add something? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, once upon a time, I lived in another county and happened to be engaged in a community that cares um, program in that, that location. Um, oh. You know, the, when, when the budget hearings are taking place, I, I did a quick check to see how that program was going. Um, and it's still operational. It's still um, fully embedded in the community. Um, and, and its uh, base of support is pretty wide. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the county did invest uh, a, a small amount early in the process of that community and communities that care for models. And um, uh, to, to give it a starting point and then pull back and allow it to be uh, self sustainable and, and continues to operate on, on that uh, uh, understanding. So, uh, you know, it, it's not often that we get to take a, a whack at reducing substance abuse and uh, strengthening families and you know, promoting positive choices when we're here at the, the dais. But I, I think this is one of those places where um, it's a model that works and that we would probably benefit the, the county by implementing it, uh, or helping to implement it in other parts of the county. Um, Frankly, it's one of those places where I think we could uh, be investing more. Um, are there other opportunities and other sources of funding for that, perhaps? Uh, but let's, uh, let's make this initial investment. Thank you. Commissioner Doctor. Yes, uh, the, the comments that have been made are very commendable. I, I think there's a definite problem out there. We have to find a solution to it. But uh, rather than investing in a, a trial project, I would rather wait till we have results to see how good of a project this is and if it can be, as uh, Commissioner Brown stated, something that can be made more regional, that can be made county wide. So uh, I, I don't see that I, I can support it at the time. And I also wonder how many other groups are out there trying to do the same work. I'm sure there are many groups out there that have the, the same uh, uh, goal. Thanks, Mr. Thank Dr. Mr. Clerk, could you call roll call vote, please, on amendment number? The roll call vote on amendment number 14, Commissioner Hartson. Yes. Commissioner Holt. Commissioner Osborne. Yes. Commissioner Zanelli. No. Commissioner Brace. No. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Dockery. Yes. Commissioner Gramis. Yes. Commissioner Nostein. No. Chairman, I recorded six votes in favor and three votes opposed. Amendment passes. Clerk, would you please introduce amendment number 15. <clears throat> amendment number 15 funds the DNL Trail expansion and the other capital projects fund. It's currently a $1 line item. It increases it to $1,151,000. And the parks fund balance is decreased by $1,151,000 to $773,745. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Um, Motion by Commissioner Holt. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Grace. Sponsor comments, Commissioner Holt. This is a cleanup item that was requested by the administration. The reason it was not included in the budget was a timing issue with regard to the approval of the DCNR from for the DCNR 10 dot grant. And now that that is approved, we're able to add it to the budget. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Thank you. I'm just happy to see this project move forward. It's a great economic uh, uh, tool, and it's going to be wonderful. And just let's get it done. Thank you. Any public comment? 
All those in favor of approving amendment number 15, please say aye. 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 Amendment 15 passes. Amendment number 16, please, Mr. Clerk. Amendment number 16, uh, the, the motion is to add a line item, Emmaus Pearl Parks Grant at $5,000 in the Parks Fund budget, and the Parks Fund balance is increased by $5,000. Thank you. We have a motion for amendment number 16. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Brown. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Grannis. Sponsor comments, Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Emmaus Pearl uh, came to me uh, requesting a uh, they wanted up to $25,000. Uh, I told them no, <laughs> um, but uh, we're requesting, they're uh, asking for $5,000. It's part of the livable landscapes here at the county. That's why I'm uh, asking for it to be put in. Uh, it ties everything in at the county level. Uh, they are using the money for a park use building site to replace hazardous and dilapidating park equipment. Uh, they have about, uh, I forget how many parks, about seven. Um, that is what the request is for. Thank you. Any other commission comments? Yes, uh, th this also flies against uh, precedence. Uh, we used to be able to give out grants like this through the Green Futures Fund. And in fact, uh, Emmaus got some Green Futures Fund uh, money in the past, playgrounds, and so forth. Uh, I cannot support this because it's for one individual municipality and we've had a procedure at the county where we do not give money out for quality of life or for some of the other programs unless it benefits the whole county. And when we had the Green Futures Fund, we had a clause in there that made sure that if any <coughs> municipality got money through that, that that facility would be open up for the whole county population. Would that be true in this case? Yes, that would be true. Mm -hmm. That would be open up to everybody in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioner comments? Commissioner Holt. Uh, I'm concerned also with what Commissioner Nockery brought up about it um, being just for the one area not being countywide focused when we were talking about communities that care we talked about it not being quite as countywide in reach and, and this way while it is open I understand for the public it's not as countywide it also concerns me that um, we didn't get any great information from advance for this one in advance and so this isn't in compliance with their grant policy um, and that kind of concerns me as well because um, I think that we need to respect that as commissioners what we're bringing forward all of that. So for those reasons, I'm not sure I can support it at this time. Commissioner Brown. Uh, just, just real briefly, uh, I believe uh, one, this is one step that I supported because uh, in my district, uh, the southern part of the district, uh, I think things like this help municipalities. And I think as a county, I think we need to do little things like this to be able to help little municipalities like that, uh, that this is something of legacy. This will be around for 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so that's why I was going there. So thank you. Mr. Thank Mr. you for your comments. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Chairman Upstein. Uh, Nathan, I'd really like you. No, <laughs> 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 so this, we'll put a plaque on it. Brad Osmond. <laughs> 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 well, whatever you have to draw my support of you. <laughs> what I'd like to, because of that, I'd like to take the opportunity, if I can, and perhaps I should know the answer to this, but I don't. The Parks Fund. How would a grant like this from the Parks Fund fit in with the, the more global goals of the Parks Fund? And, and what is the Parks Fund fund balance? Commissioners. Last year, this board approved Northern Lehigh Community Center's $20,000 grant. No discussions. The only discussion was me saying, do we really want to set a precedence for this? This board approved it. This evening, another commissioner comes back and says he has $5,000 request for a community. And we set precedence for it. So I know some of you are saying we didn't, and this is precedent setting. It's been done. 
Commissioners, I think uh, the livable landscape plan does call for us to take an active role in our communities. Uh, commissioners, I think the, the $5,000 that Commissioner Brown is requesting should probably be $5,000 for every district commissioner to seed the landscape seed. I hope you follow my connection. To actually seed uh, the, uh, the livable landscape plan in the communities. I, I think this is something that uh, we're not talking green future funding. We're talking about an opportunity to create dialogues with our communities. Uh, and I would actually ask that you make it 25,000, five for each district, and have you have some responsibility to go out into your municipalities that are in your area, or in your case one, <laughs> and, and discuss how their municipal <laughs> planning can assist the county in maintaining our livable landscape plan that this board approved several months back. Commissioner, you asked about the money. The money comes from uh, Marcella Shelby. It uh, comes to us and we use that money to fund our parks uh, budget. Uh, we use that for um, support or, or, or matching for DCR grants or for a PennDOT grant. Um, we currently have an unallocated budget um, or I'm sorry, an unallocated fund balance scheduled for the end of 2019 that's probably around $675,000 of monies. But before you say, we're well, got a lot of money, commissioners consider the five-year capital plan where I'm using that money uh, to, to chase after some of the parks and rent projects and <coughs> these projects here in the county. So we use that money, we fund our projects in the, in the county that way, um, and I don't think uh, Commissioner Brown did ask. I said, I think it's a good idea. He said the magic word, the landscape, and that's why I think the administration uh, was certainly supportive of his initiative. Commissioner Dockery and then Commissioner Osborne. Yes, uh, uh, saying that we broke the precedent with uh, the Northern Lehigh Center uh, doesn't uh, Win any points with me because that was a quality of life grant that expired. And when it expired, the previous board, of which I was a part, stated that they, if they came back, I said I would support their grant since that was an expired quality of life. But uh, in, in terms of uh, Setting up a, a, a grant of, of each district getting money, I, I think that's a good idea. And we also have a parks committee on which all of you had a chance to sign up. And it is the parks committee that should be looking at uh, uh, things such as this. So this did not go through the parks committee. I don't know if. We even have representation on the Parks Committee anymore. Yes, Chairman Dockery. One of the things I'd like to mention is the $20,000 grant for the uh, Northern Grand Community Center was uh, authorized uh, by an uh, amendment by Commissioner Creighton at the time, and that was for the feasibility study, in which we spent $3,000 or $3,800. And it did not go to the construction, it did not go to anything else. Uh, as far as the Parks Committee, I asked uh, about that early on, and I was told that. <laughs> We don't have any representation like committee because committee is on, even though it's on paper, it doesn't exist. So I, I yeah. So so let's not talk about that. Uh, I, I I like what uh, the landscape portion. I think we should be we all talk about approving the plan and we go into detail about what shouldn't be between the future fund and what should be this word and that word. Play word semantics. Listen. If five thousand dollars could be spread, Cameron, I can tell you right now that we're really an amphitheater at Victory Park and Slade. It's going to cost seventy-five to eighty thousand dollars to put an ADA, ADA compliant uh, path from the road to that amphitheater. It's going to cost uh, upwards of eighty thousand dollars just for the path itself. And the amphitheater is only like eighty-five thousand dollars. So, you know, when you start making improvements in the parks, there's a lot of things you have to look at. And 
I would be willing to uh, find a way to entertain a motion to put that $5,000 in every district commissioner's uh, pocket and walk around and come back to the board with some sort of a program that we can approve. I think it's a good thing. I think that's what the local landscape is, is all about. Uh, so, I mean, you said 25000 uh, 25, So it's $5,000 for each uh, district commission. Um, oh, I so it, 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 it is what, who has the floor? Do you have the floor or do I have the floor? Commissioner Brown, your $5,000 would already be allocated. But now I'm looking at $5,000 for every other district commissioner. So, uh, Ms. Rosemary, can we uh, put something together uh, along with <coughs> the amendment put forward? Well, she can take the time to put it in there, right? Can she not? Well, can she? I mean, what are the rules? Can we do that? Can you put something in writing? What is writing? Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you said I'll follow up. Okay. Well, I'll follow up. I'll follow up. Any more? Uh, are we still on the chair or do I not have the chair? Do I have some more or do I not have the floor? I believe everybody said we are. Okay. It's a point. It's a point. Yes. Okay. Do I have a question? Okay. Yeah, call for us. This is a roll call vote on the public stuff. Public comment. Yes, public comment. Yes, public comment. Mr. Clerk, do we have a motion for amendment number 17? So moved. 
Motion by Commissioner Osborne. Second. Second by Commissioner Docker. Sponsor comments. Commissioner Osborne. Thank you, Chairman Epstein. I have uh, several things that I would like to uh, use as support for this amendment and be the primary sponsor. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say it was clear to me that this budget had to be adjusted upon arrival. The five-year financial plan that accompanied this budget showed in just 2020, so one year from now, the stabilization fund was being proposed to be drawn down to less than $13 million well below GFOA standards. It was also clear to me that the 4.1% proposed tax increase was not the result of what's needed to be funded in our, for our responsibilities in 2019. Thirdly, it was clear to me that while this financial projection that supported the request from the administration for this tax increase, it was very understandable because of its simplicity, but it's, it's simplicity that is part of the problem here. It doesn't account for several of the other cost drivers like health care and pension costs and the opportunities that those exist when we study them and other significant cost drivers in the county budget. And thirdly, it's clear to me that the financial projection did not include the, the historical favorable balances that this board has seen in county budgets in the last six years. And I'll give you an example. The range from $2.6 million to $13.0 million of favorable variance in the last six years, an average of $7.6 million. To a comment uh, by one of our board members earlier th this uh, evening, I also would like to see the county be able to budget in a way that we can um, count on the accounting that's presented, certainly in the five-year financial projection. So, for me, until there's a demonstrated need and it's justified, I can't support any additional tax burden on our citizens in the county. Thank you, Commissioner Osborne. Commissioner Brown. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just real briefly, uh, I will be supporting this amendment. Uh, there are still some variables that are unknown. Uh, we need to look at our expenses and, and get a handle of the uh, variables. Uh, I do believe, though, that I do want to give the citizens uh, a heads up that there is going to be a tax increase. It's going to be coming soon. I don't know if it's 2020 or 2021, but uh, you should know that it is coming because I think that is where we're headed. I want to thank Tim Reeves, uh, our CFO, because you know what? He did a five-year projection, uh, I don't want to say plan, but it's a five-year projection showing us uh, going down. Uh, over the past few years, we had a, a good run. Uh, I believe with the millage rates being cut, we're at uh, the, the revenue that was down about $13.5 million over the past three, four years. Uh, now, when we bring that tax increase uh, back because of uh, pay raises, pensions, and health care, um, we'll, we'll see how things go. But I think there's some variables. That's why I'm supporting it. I still think there's some variables that we have to look, work out. I think starting after this is all done, uh, we'll start working on that. And again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Mr. Briggs? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, just at our last budget hearing, um, Tim gave us three pages of paper, then gave us models. Um, and on a phone conversation that I had with Commissioner Osborne on Monday, um, we had a, a conversation in which we were disagreeing. I didn't have my numbers in front of me. So, uh, I, I will concede, uh, Commissioner Osborne, you were right um, about uh, my remarks on the forecast um, that uh, based on Tim's numbers, we would be looking at, you know, uh, not being completely <coughs> that we talked about, um, that we've added to uh, uh, financing for 2019. I don't see how we don't end up uh, with some some rating decreases and interest rate increases as a result of that. Um, I don't think anybody wants to be in a situation where we have to raise taxes, taxes. But when we're talking about the investment, meeting the commitment that we've made to invest in Cedar to the tune of $70 million, that investment, that commitment, comes with some hard numbers. And those hard numbers necessitate actions to, to fulfill our obligation. 
Um, so I'm going to oppose this amendment because if we don't uh, act on the, the millage increase this year, we're looking at a millage increase that exceeds what's being proposed in another year. Yes, uh, I am still going to support this after all of the scare tactics that we've heard, and uh, I, I have a, a great deal of respect for Mr. Reeves and his projections, but projections are projections, and I have been duped so many times in the past that we are going to have a tax increase if you don't do this, don't do that, and uh, we always hear that, and we always end up with a fund balance at the end of the year. I know eventually that is going to run out. We are going to have to pay the piper sometime, but I don't think it's this year's budget that we're looking at. Commissioner Dockery, Commissioner Grams, and Mr. Chilton. I too would like to thank Mr. Reeves. I've had hours and hours of discussions with him, asking some questions, and every time he gives me one answer, just like many others up here, we have another question. Um, talking with some of our fellow commissioners, I think we, we have to really get a grip on this amendment. We, we don't really know what our expenses are. I mean, we have a new budget before us. We have something that's out there that we just received several months ago. I've heard talk with Commissioner Osborne about a strategic plan, and I see that's a way to get us where we want to go. We need to look at that, and, and, and I can look at the work if you want that particular detail, because I think we're going to find things out as we move forward. Uh, and I agree with Commissioner Brown. I think somewhere down the line there's going to be an adjustment that's going to have to be made. It's a matter of how much and finding the right number and doing everything we can along the way to work for the citizens of Lehigh County. I can tell you that if I, I was out there just as many of us were the past several weeks and say, you know what, there's a possibility that there's going to be a tax increase. And you know what the answer was that I got? Mark, we trust you to do the right thing. The trust that the people place in us as commissioners is overwhelming. They put us here for a reason. And it's not a Republican or a Democrat or people, well, a lot of people aren't even registered to vote. You know, those are the people that we represent. And I think we owe it to the to, to those people, uh, not only the ones that voted for us to put us here, but to everybody that we represent not only in our district, but throughout the county, to make a good uh, decision that's well thought out. Not just when we see the budget for the first time, but everybody talks about it, working on the budget from day one starts with a strategic plan, and uh, uh, so along those lines, uh, I think there's a lot of good ideas that should be putting in place at the earliest possible convenience. So for those reasons, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Any public comment? Well, I'm sorry. Um, I refuse to be part of kicking the can when it came to LCA, and I'm going to refuse to be part of kicking the can down the road here with this imagery. I have to disagree with Commissioner Brandis, I absolutely think this is partisan. I think that this is not about commissioners doing what's best for the county and about them serving the people in the role that they currently hold. I think this is about people in their re-election cycles, report admin, controller, state rep, and Congress. This is about people not wanting to increase taxes before or during their race. And I think it's deplorable. I won't support this. Thank you. Comment, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dean Browning. I reside in South Whitehall Township. Seems like that every seven to eight years or so, the financial situation of Lehigh County reaches a point where the administration presents the Board of Commissioners with a budget that calls for a tax increase. Tonight is one of those nights where you guys earn your exorbitant salary as you consider <laughs> Amendment 17. As you're going through that, though, I'd like to give you some, point, some thoughts for context and specifics as you consider this. After the last tax increase, which went into effect by the call back in 2010, 
There were several folks that ran for this board promising to do three things. One, completely eliminate the tax increase, which happened to be 16% at that time. They promised to reduce spending, and they promised to pass budgets that were balanced. <laughs> it is now eight years later, and none of those promises have been kept. I say that not to criticize those who failed to fulfill uh, what they set out to do. On the contrary, they were a number of bright, talented, capable people who clearly had clear objectives that they worked hard on, yet they could not be achieved. I believe that is due to several systemic factors that I think you need to take into consideration as you're considering Amendment 17. First is the basic fiscal structure that all governments rely on property taxes operating under. That is, the cost of operating government grows with inflation and population growth, whereas the revenue component is immune to inflation and is only loosely correlated to population growth. Secondly, and related to that, delivering the services provided by the county is a labor-intensive business. That constitutes a very large component of the county costs that are covered by real estate property taxes. It's been a number of years since I set up there, but off the top of my head, I, my calculation is that roughly 70 to 75 percent of the dollars that the property tax dollars that are spent go to gross wages and benefits for the employees. So unless you match revenue reductions with real spending reductions and take steps to control employee compensation by either reducing the number of employees or reducing how you compensate them, you have a repeating cycle which inexorably leads to the point where you are with the budget of 2019. As an example, from the chart that I just handed out, and there are copies in the back if anyone is interested, the seeds for the tax increase in 2010 were sown back in the fall of 2005 when taxes were cut without any real corresponding reduction in spending. Subsequently to that, wages increased and benefits increased, primarily driven by union contracts. And that trend was exacerbated by using reserves to cover the growing gap between expenses and revenue. I should note that much the same thing that can be said for the county budget since 2015. As an aside, I think it's important to note that once the decision is made to go down the path of authorizing overspending and using reserve funds to balance the budget, indicates that another tax increase is all but certain once those reserve funds dwindle beyond a certain point. Approving budgets where you plan to spend more than you take in and then hoping for the best, even if that happens, is simply not sound fiscal policy. I know you talked about that year in and year out the county does better than budget, and I think Commissioner Osborne mentioned the past six years. If you go back to 2013, the Board of Commissioners <laughs> authorized the administration to spend roughly $7 million more than they took it in revenue. And guess what? That's exactly what the administration did. If you believe that balanced budgets are really the linchpin to avoiding future tax increases and properly matching revenue to expenses, the question is, why do we fail as a board to deliver that? As I see it, the problem is that the current system is not set up to start with that, with a budget that is truly balanced. Section 704A of the Home Rule Charter calls for the budget to be balanced, but it allows the balancing to be accomplished by using both the total of estimated income and cash reserves. Changing that, in my mind, is really the starting point that you need to focus on to allow you to have a level playing field going forward. If you pass Amendment 17, which I would suggest that you do, I would suggest that you also take steps to address the systemic problem that leads you to the situation that you're in. As it is, you're presented with a budget that has been agreed to by everyone else in the county government. It has an operating deficit and it also has a tax increase. So your options at this point are limited. You can make changes at the margin, which is what you're trying to be doing with Amendment 18 by eliminating the steps and cutting $207,000. Or you can make changes and engage in minutia, such as changing the funding source of a $15,000 expenditure at a $500 million budget, 
Or you can send the budget back and ask for no tax increase. And in essence, that's what Amendment, Amendment 17 is doing, sending the budget back with no tax increase. Again, I would suggest that you pass Amendment 17, but I would also suggest that you take steps to propose a balanced budget amendment, amendment to the Home Rule Charter that would prohibit the use of tax reserves to balance the budget for future budgets. It would require that budget expenses not exceed budgeted revenue, period. The amendment would also include an exception allowing for the use of reserves in emergencies or to give a credit to taxpayers providing the underlying budget is still balanced. Those exceptions would require an affirmative vote of six commissioners. Having a budget that is truly balanced from the start before it is presented to the Board of Commissioners is, in my opinion, a key component needed to avoid the type of exercise that you're going through tonight and will give you a clear starting point to decide whether a tax increase is appropriate or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to comment on that. Um, first of all, Dean, as always, very articulate, and uh, you made some very good points, and I thank you for that. The problem that I see with us considering, even considering a balanced budget amendment is this. It's because we don't have a good track record of estimating expenses versus revenue. In fact, I just pointed out, where in the last six years, we've averaged $7.5 million favorable variance. So the problem is this year, just let's take 2019 as it was proposed to this board. With, with the fund balance being proposed and going down to $25 million, this is the stabilization fund down to approximately $19.6 million. We would have to raise taxes based on this budget if we were to have a balanced budget amendment by almost 10% this year. That would be okay if we had better handle on <coughs> expenses than we do today. Otherwise, what's gonna to continue to happen is taxes will go up, taxes will go up, taxes will go up, as we continue to, to fill the offers. One last comment and then I'll stop. I've been on the board six years, six budget years. This is the seventh budget year. Our board has over the years cut taxes, provided rebates to everyone. And yet, at the end of every fiscal year, audited, we ended up with $25 million in stabilization fund just where we started, even with the projections that were dire at times. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Public comment, please. You know, when for me, man, I'm gonna not speak as articulately as Browning, but just as a layman, Kind of resident of Leigh County who's very, very tired at this point. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me to have such a huge capital, you know, capital expenses going on and to reduce the millage rate. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. No way we have to do an rate increase anyway. In my personal opinion, personally, I know it's always easier for my family budget have small incremental raises rather than one huge one. So if you're going to do it, certainly do it incrementally. And don't, and, and don't, it just, and, and obviously this is an election year, let's face it. I don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna point fingers, but it really seems kind of shady. So, that's all. Uh, the rubber leaks to the road. I watched this board for seven years bipartisan wise offer a lot of good fiscal common sense moves. Now when it came down to actually cutting taxes, it was a bit of a divide. But I saw this board implement a lot of good ideas that had fiscal impacts. I agree with Mr. Browning about some sort of new structure on how to deal with it. So let's start with what I mentioned at the committee here. 2014, $10.2 million deficit, actually $1.7 million surplus. 2015, $5.4 million deficit, actually a $3.6 million surplus. 2016, $6.5 million deficit, $2.8 million surplus. 
and last year, $10.8 million deficit. Proposed $1.6 million surplus. My back of the envelope, the calculation tells me over those four years, we accumulated $10 million in surpluses. Where's that money? That should be put in a unspendable fund, and this board should determine what to do with that money. Maybe you move it into capital and move towards cash and carry. Maybe you use it as a tax cut or a tax credit. Maybe you fund long-term post-employment benefits with that money. I, I seem to think the, the administration can just spend it on what they want. No, that wasn't in the budget. Could that even be a misallocation of funds? That might be interesting to look into. So again, this is crisis budgeting. I've used the term before. School districts use it all the time. Oh, we're gonna have to eliminate the third grade and 100 teachers because we're gonna have a 20 million dollar deficit. We gotta raise your taxes and they end up with a nice big huge surplus. It's budgeting by crisis. We have not touched, uh, contrary to Mr. Browning, we did not touch one dollar of the stabilization fund all those years. It was doom and gloom. Not one dollar. I'll read it again for those who want to make that argument. A $5.5 million underwrite transfer from the stabilization fund to the operating fund did not occur. 2017 audit page nine. Same kind of statement in 2016, 2015, 2014. I'll compile them all for you. This is crisis budgeting. Taxes don't have to go up. I keep talking about the natural growth of property tax revenue. What is that number? 2% a year, 3% a year? And to correct something else Mr. Browning said, I'll gladly show him my work. This board with those four tax cuts, when you account for the prior 50% assessment and, and normalize everything, at 3.64 mills, you achieved the lowest millage rate in over 25 years. Not only did you roll back the Cunningham Browning tax hike, you rolled back Republican Jane Irvin's tax hike. Because he's valid on that point, the spending merrily continued, but she realized then she was in political trouble after a 60% tax hike. So how is this county getting by? I said it before. Have you driven around compared to 25 years ago? You're bringing in record property tax revenue, and it's growing every year. I bet you for 15, 20 years, we saw double-digit revenue growth per mill. You have the lowest millage rate in 25 years. That's a heck of an achievement. That's what's going on here. Some people want to wipe out that with a stroke of a pen by claiming a crisis. Frankly, I don't know why that's not being trumpeted all over the county. It was a phenomenal achievement. So both those tax hikes have been rolled back. And this is not a tax cut. It's just saying we're, we're not going to raise taxes with the stroke of a pen and wipe out that phenomenal achievement. So who's really being political here? Jeez, it's funny. One side is political, the other side is noble and never political. It's because it all boils down to you don't need the money, just like the $5 car tax. It's been proven you don't need the money. The municipalities are sitting on millions of dollars and liquid fuels funds they don't even spend. So I'm sorry, support this amendment because who is being political? You know, the first tax cut proposed, I sat here and listened to the doom and gloom. One of the commissioners said, I hate to have to shut the prison down and watch all the criminals run through the streets of Lehigh County. The next year I came to the podium I said, did I miss the 69 news reports in the morning call articles about the prison shutting down and the criminals running free through the streets? It's budgeting by crisis to justify an ever more money grab that's not necessary. Because if they grab this money, you're going to have a deficit projected for next year because they're just going to spend it. Do not raise taxes. The day may come. And when I say, you know what, we may need to bump the tax rate up, I mean, everybody's going to have a freaking heart attack on both sides of the aisle. But I'm a realist. You don't need the money now. And we do need to get better projections. And we need a process to lock down those $10 million of surpluses. If I, where is it going? Where is it disappearing? 
It was projected to be 3.3 at the end of last year. Audits is 1.6. Stabilization fund is only $100,000 higher. Where did that 1.6 million go? Thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, my name is Don Harrington. I live in San Hello, Valley. Hello, Mr. from the Dutch. I right moved here about 15 months ago from Minnesota, where we elected a professional wrestler to be our governor. I can't think. And <laughs> when there was a budget surplus, he uh, he pushed the legislators to give it to give it all to give it all to the taxpayers. <laughs> a huge tax uh, relief. And then the governors who followed him uh, were in trouble. And instead of raising taxes, which you know, modest, they, they, they took the tobacco settlement that came to the state of Minnesota, they took reserve funds, and they were able to get by. But the succeeding years got darker and darker and darker. I appreciate the work that you do. I also appreciate the work that your county staff does. And looking at that <coughs> projection, I would, uh, I would put more value in it than, uh, than some of you do. And I would agree with the comment that was made before that um, <coughs> that I would rather have a, a smaller increases than, than a huge one. If that if you're looking at a 10% one or something like that in a couple of years, I'd rather have you raise it. What you are doing is restoring where this county was in 2014, with the military. I hope you will do that. You're restoring, you're not, I mean, yes, you're raising taxes, but you're restoring what was. And uh, and so I would speak against uh, Amendment 17 and, and ask you to uh, to go with the budget. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ann Carr, the High County Controller. I'm just not gonna speak on this, but I can't go by without uh, correcting some falsehoods that were just made. Uh, Lehigh County used to be assessed at 50%. Thus, the tax rate was, the millage was set at 14. And when we reassessed it to 100%, it dropped to 7. Yeah, my record was on it. Yeah. So 14 would be 14, the same as it was. Half of 7, half of 14 is 7. 50%, 100%. There was absolutely no reduction in uh, tax cuts that wiped out all those tax cuts for all those years. Dave Perilla can, uh, Clerk Perilla can find the legislation. I'm sure the fiscal officer can show you that the revenues were neutral and the millage rate is exactly the same as it was uh, a decade and a half ago. So it's just you can't just go saying things that aren't true and say you gotta do it your home. I did, we had four cash cuts. We had 3.64 mills. That's a lot. I'm Armstrong County Executive. Um, I'm gonna start by saying very, very honestly, doing a $506 million budget for me, being my first one, my son even said, Dad, you were a department head, but what do you know about $506 million budget? And I said, you're absolutely correct. That's why, and I agree with the gentleman from Minnesota, we have a staff here, CPAs, 30 years experience. They and myself sat with every department and listened to every department's needs. We then looked at, because the Board of Commissioners requested five years. And yes, we, we agree. We could probably go this, this budget without an increase. But all we're doing by that is ignoring the future. And I wish this wasn't a political thing. I think this is just a case of numbers. And I put so much faith in Tim and his department. And I asked him to do the projections. What will happen if we don't do it now? And we're looking at a 10%, 12% increase. So it's just that, you know, it's like the old commercial with the car broke down, pay me now or pay me later. You do the oil change to keep the car running or before you know it, your engine locks up. He sat down today and explained to me that 75% 
of our budget are fixed costs. Seventy-five percent of those expenses equal 112 million. That's exactly what this tax rate would bring in. I would love to say to you that we would never have to do that. That would be the most popular thing for me to say. Let's never ever. And we, uh, to be honest with you, we did projections. If it had stayed at 3.79, we could go to 2023 and still be the best funded county in the state. But that's history. We can't do that because it was lowered back. And I can't go back to that. I'd love to, and I would have begged never to, people were used to paying this if you kept it there. The surplus we have now for a bond rating, for money towards Cedar Brook, would be fantastic. That's why we're under the bridge. We're dealing with what's going on right now. And very, very strongly, the administration, with the support of our fiscal department, the numbers just don't work down in 2020, 2021. We're taking four and a half million dollars out of our projected revenue if we take this tax back down. And that is really going to kick, the, kick us back in the future. And I can't face the people of the county telling them that I didn't do what was right today. So I am firmly against that amendment. Thank you. Fritz Walker from uh, South Whitehall. Uh, I'd like to echo the comments made by the gentleman from Minnesota. Uh, I'd be much more comfortable having modest increases in taxes rather than get hit by a large increases in taxes. And um, I also, I think the last speaker, our executive just said, pay me now or pay me later. I think the situation is likely to be pay me now or pay me more later. I'd rather have you be truly conservative on this issue and do what makes sense at the current time. I would uh, reject this amendment. Thank you, Chris. Commissioner Hall. Last year, a proposal was brought forward to improve the cash flow of the county annually by $4 million without requiring the tax increase to make this improvement. And the administration and the majority of the board did not see the necessity of doing this. So now the board is hearing the opposite, that a $4 million annual cash flow improvement is necessary. With 75% of our costs fixed, the question I'm asking myself is what changed in a year? Because 75% of our costs are fixed. And so when I'm struggling with reconciling these two vastly different recommendations in such a short period of time, I really do agree with the comments that were made earlier about the need for strategic planning because I think that it doesn't make sense when you get two recommendations like this that are so completely opposite. And so that's why I'm going to be supporting that time so you can look more into this to see what, what really is the case here. Mr. Clerk, would you please call a roll call vote? For amendment number 17. Commissioner Osborne? Yes. Commissioner Zanelli? No. Commissioner Briggs? No. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Dockey? Yes. Commissioner Gramis? Yes. Commissioner Nostein? Yes. Commissioner Hartzell? No. And Commissioner Holt? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I recorded six votes in favor and three votes opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we're going to change up the order of the amendments. Uh, I would like to have you, Mr. Clerk introduce amendment number 20, please. Okay. Amendment number 20. We will provide pay scales for non-union employees. Pay scale 9 for non-union employees is changed from closed 9 steps to 12 steps. There's a conversion charge to take employees from the 2018 step to the 2019 step. Each future step represents a 2.25 increase in salary. Employees at the top of the pay scale receive a lump sum payment of 2.25% and their base pay is not increasing. Non-union nursing managers on pay scale six do not, do not increase to a fifth step. They receive a lump sum payment of 2.25% and 
and their base pay is not increasing. This also impacts the sheriff's union part-timers who receive 2.25 and not 2.5. Uh, PSS, the PSSU meet discuss unit, pay scale 15, who receives 2.25 and not 2.5. And non-classified service employees on pay scale 16 uh, would receive 2.25 and not 2.5 percent. Mr. Chairman, the scale itself is attached to the amendment as Exhibit 20A. The, uh, within the text of the amendment is the uh, conversion chart that shows the 18th step or the current step to 2019. The savings from this change estimated are, are estimated at $200,000 and will be removed from the appropriate personnel line items. And the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund is decreased by an estimated $200,000. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. <coughs> we have a motion for amendment number 20. Yes. So, motion by Mr. Clerk. Second. Motion by Commissioner Cole, second by Commissioner Docker. Sponsor comments, please. Um, I think it was <coughs> pretty accurately summarized. Um, this proposes a new pay scale of 2.25% step to provide employees with a step increase or um, as with the standard step system, those at the top of the scale will receive a lump sum in lieu of a step. These steps are more in line with recent wage increases at the county, the five-year average general wage increase that has been given out over the last um, five years, like I said, is 2.2%. Employees under this proposal are moved to the step above the one, which most closely matches their current pay. And transitioning to the new pay scale, employees would receive a wage increase between 2.25% and 4.1%. The average wage increase is 2.7% in 2019. Um, I consider this pay scale to be transitional change until we have the additional information available through the completion of the pay study. I do feel it is important to um, at least do something to try and address those that have been at that step one for so long without any kind of step movement, but I do not feel it's appropriate to reinstitute the step system we had without the, um, in the absence of the information we're looking to get from the, the pay study to make a more informed decision. I think this is a transitional change to use until we can get there and make a final decision. I'll defer to my co sponsor on this amendment for. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Dockery. Yes, thank you. Uh, I hate steps. I, I really hate them because in my past life, I was a teacher and I saw how steps at, at that institution were 5%. They rewarded the people at the top of the step so much more than the people at the bottom. But I think it's also very unfair that when we had negotiations with the sheriff's union, one poor guy on the committee worked here for six years and was still getting the same salary as someone coming in. So I think people who have experience need to have steps. So I am all for having steps until we can find some better way. I've had discussions with other people and I, I even look at the possibility of uh, putting in an amendment for, uh, especially for the low officers. I mentioned this to V.A. Uh, Martin when he appeared before the Finance Committee that I thought that uh, he was better able to make the pay increases in his own department. I think that we should find a way where we can get a merit-based system where department heads can spread the money out rather than having everybody get the same step. That seems like everybody has the same expertise. But I do think that people who have been here on the job deserve a step increase, and that's why I am supporting this at this time, until we can get a pay study done. Thank you, Mr. Doctor. Any other commissioner comments? Any public comment? <laughs> Oh, thank you, Commissioner Nostein, for moving this up in the order. <laughs> I thought you were moving to first, not exactly 19. Um, let, me, let me say this. 
say, I, I, you know, I trust the commissioners. I, I, I do. I trust them and have confidence in the commissioners uh, when they're uh, navigating through uh, the challenges of union negotiations. I believe uh, you're representing the, uh, the county taxpayer as well as the, uh, the union staff and the value that we receive in those contracts. Um, you know, the collaboration that you show uh, during those negotiations, I believe, um, is the reason why we have successful labor relations here in the county of Lehigh. Um, but I have a disappointment. I have lots of disappointments, but the disappointment that I want to talk about tonight is the non-union staff. And um, the fact is, this year, and I'm going to speak collectively, not individually, uh, the union increases for the county of Lehigh at 3.2%. We don't hear anything tonight about saving money or adjusting the union contracts to represent uh, a potential real or not real need to save $200,000. Um, what's being proposed this evening by the commissioners uh, is reducing the non-union salary um, to 2.25 or 2.5 or quite honestly 12 steps or whatever the step program is, then I hear, hey, you know what, it's only going to be transitional because we're doing a study and then that study's going to give us advice. So we're going to sit back and we're going to make changes to the bureaucracy of our county's pay system. For one year, it makes no sense, commissioners makes no sense to me. For 10 years, our union staff has averaged 1% more than the non-union staff. So I'm happy that Commissioner uh, Holt pointed out that our average uh, um, uh, salary increases were two something. What she didn't tell you was what the average was for the union staff. Do you have that number, Commissioner Holt? It's more than 3.5%. So, Let's talk about the need right now. We have a compensation study on the way. That compensation study, according to our director of HR, will provide us some choices. It's not going to tell us exactly what to do. It'll give us choices on how to craft a plan, craft a policy for our non-union staff. So, I'm a bit confused how we got these numbers that I heard this evening. Did we stick our finger in the air? to check the temperature or check the wind direction? Or worse, did we just come up with a plan because we thought those numbers sounded good? Commissioners, I'm asking you today to reconsider. I believe, I like to represent myself, but tonight I'm representing 800 members of this workforce who are not here. I was gonna go into a more grand story about peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> Talk about the white balance. I don't write students. <laughs> the white balance of peanut butter and jelly. But I'm not going to. You know, in business school, you learn about factors of motivation. You know, the number one factor of motivation is what's inside you. It's not pay. It's what's inside you. It's the job that you do. Many of our staff have been doing the jobs that they do and are motivated to do that job because that's what they believe in. It comes from within. So motivation is not managed through pay increase. Men, it's motivated and motivation comes from the work itself. We believe we do important things here in this county. Now, hygiene factors. No, I'm not talking about combing your hair. I'm talking about maintenance factors that matter in the workforce. They may not add to motivation, but commissioners, they will absolutely lead towards satisfaction or the opposite, dissatisfaction. The number one reason why employees are dissatisfied is salary. They believe it's important to be paid for what they believe they're worth. The next factor, hygiene factor, very important for creating satisfaction, is policy. And never would it be appropriate for us to have a policy discussion this evening. It seems to me that we missed our opportunities over the last year to talk about policy changes to the payroll system. 
commissioners, compensation, bad policy means dissatisfied workers. They're still going to get up and do their jobs because they're motivated, because they're motivated by the job they do. Whether you're in a coroner's office, the controller's office, or any administration, or even your own staff in the commissioner's office. Again, it's not a motivator, but it certainly can create dissatisfaction. Commissioners, if you're studying Hertzberg, he tells you all about hygiene and, and motivation. But look, you've got to address ways to stop job dissatisfaction. You've got to fix a poor system. We have a poor system where every year we come before you with a number and you elect to change the number or we walk out of here happy that you didn't for a non-union workforce. Why would we expect our staff to feel comfortable coming tonight and looking at you nine and hoping by some grace of God you will not change the recommended pay scale plan? You've got to stop dissatisfaction. And you've got to figure out ways to create satisfaction. Those are things like Commissioner Graham has mentioned tonight. Things like achievement, recognizing, rewarding, advancement. Those are things that really matter and create satisfaction. But look, you can't get anywhere to create satisfaction or create and maintain motivation if you're not directing the needs to the most basic hygiene which is compensation. Without compensation, we will not achieve rewarding. I heard somebody earlier tonight said, I don't want a pen, I'd rather have pay. Commissioners, um, I, I believe that person is probably correct. And he would fit exactly what every study as it relates to human resource management will tell you. Reduce dissatisfaction, create satisfaction, hire motivated people. Look, basic needs, salary, security needs, benefits, belongingness needs, cooperation, esteem needs, respect and recognition, and then ultimately, self-actualization. When I believe I'm an expert and I'm asked to represent an expert opinion, that makes me feel good. That's how you move the workforce forward. Not the second Wednesday of October, we placed a non-union staff on some kind of a, a spinning wheel and decide how to manage policy. Commissioners, all leaders in every business want to develop a successful workforce. It's how you win. Our policy uh, presented by the executive um, for, for this year does include returning to steps. But commissioners, I think the benefit of doing the model as we know it is that our bureaucratic system here in the county doesn't need to make any additional changes. We can make that happen as we await the compensation plan. Look, uh, I'd like you to maintain the administration's plan, which is a collective 3.1% increase to the non-union workforce. Commissioners, if you're really serious about our workforce, um, you got to create time uh, to learn. Uh, it takes us as, as directors or managers or row officers 365 days a year. 365 days a year working with our people. Not 26 days a year. 365 days managing our workforce, both union and non-union. Finally, make a good decision. The workforce is watching. We're not going to be more motivated tomorrow because we believe in what we do, but we can be more satisfied. <clears throat> Thank you, but again, please take the appropriate action tonight. Um, vote down both of the amendments before you. Um, our non-union staff will believe that you are working to close that gap that we've created the last 10 years. So commissioners, I know there's others that would like to speak. Um, I'm asking you to consider the amendments and vote no. Thank you. Good evening. My name is James B. Mark. 
Franco, the elected district attorney of Lehigh County. I'm a resident of Upper Saucon Township. And except for Dr. Doherty, I think I've been around here longer than anybody else up on that dies. I'm in my 21st year as district attorney. For the first 10 or so, I would say that things went real smoothly in terms of employee compensation and satisfaction. I join with what Mr. Mulchamy just expressed. Uh, I am not an expert uh, in employee compensation, but I am, I think, somewhat tuned to employee dissatisfaction. And I can tell you that I represent uh, nothing against unions, but I represent the non-union bargaining people in my office. And if this kind of thing continues, I'm relatively certain that I'm going to have a bargaining unit in my office. And in fact, I would exhort them to consider that. Because in my opinion, the predecessor boards, to you folks, have treated the non-union employees of Lehigh County over the past several years very shabbily. They don't deserve it. I've heard several people up there uh, sing the praises of the employees of Lehigh County tonight, and justifiably so. And I'll sing the praises of the people in my office and the people throughout the county uh, with whom I have a daily association. Uh, we have excellent employees, and this county is in the business of providing service. And those service providers are those employees. Concession of old age, I have to start putting classes on to read my own handwriting. But I, I came before you at, at the budget hearing in September, and I said to you that I applauded the reinstitution of the step increases. And I do. Uh, I've read the amendment that's presently being considered, Amendment 20, with 12 steps instead of 8, and a 2.25% increase. I've read Commissioner Os Osborne's 2.5% uh, budget amendment. And the problem is that in neither case are the employees going to be treated better or equally to what the administration has proposed. And it's high time that they be treated better. Uh, predecessor boards have uh, removed longevity pay. Uh, they've removed step increases in the past, I think in 2013. They removed longevity pay at some point along the way. And, and more importantly than that, really, and, and again picking up on something Mr. Mulchaney alluded to, each year for about the last 10, the employee, the non-union employees of Lehigh County have been filled with angst because of what has occurred in this process. In August, Executive Armstrong issued his letter to every county employee. And I'll just read one, one part of it. Quote, the elements of the 2019 budget, which I believe are of the greatest importance to you, are, first bullet point, quote, I have proposed returning to the eight-step pay model to ensure parity with our union co-workers. In 2019, those at the eight-step will be receiving a pay increase of 2.5%. That letter went to every employee. And when I went back to my office after the budget was presented by the county executive and I met with him, and I said, hey, you know, this is what's presented, but you know, it's not final until the board commission has approved the budget. Do you really think they heard that? You've got 2,000 employees who for the last six weeks have been thinking they're going to get the reinstitution of the steps and a 2.5% increase. Now look, let's look for a moment at what this budget does, or these proposed amendments do. The amendment that's before you returns an estimated $200,000 to the stabilization fund. That's less than one-tenth of one percent of the tax, county tax dollars portion of the budget, the $112 million. Do you, do you really think that's worth it? And if you look at, at Commissioner Osborne's, that's slightly over two-tenths of one percent. Really? Yeah, you, you've got a workforce that's 
a terrific workforce. They ought to be compensated fairly. I pointed out to you when I was before you, and I, I gave you a portion of a letter that I addressed to the executive. I've got, and I'm not going to get into the names, but I've got four assistant district attorneys who are in the first step. One of them has been in the first step for four and a half years, making exactly the same as an employee who was hired a year ago, making exactly the same as an employee who was hired in April of this year, making exactly the same as an employee who was hired in July of this year and making a few thousand dollars less than an employee that came over in a lateral move two years ago. Now, is that fair? And neither, not, neither the, the executive's proposal or Commissioner Armstrong's proposal or Commissioner Dockin and Commissioner Holt's proposal is going to cure that. But it needs to be cured. And, and that's why I think you know, the pay study has a great deal of merit. But let's get on with it. It's been three years. Employees were denied any raise at all, by my recollection, on the premise that the pay study was going to take place. And it hasn't. And the people who were driving that, except for one, are going to be gone by the end of this year. Two of them are already gone. So you're going to have to start anew, and you've got another phase of a pay study that has to come into play. So I'm going to ask you to consider, please, not passing either of these amendments and keeping in intact the administration's proposal because I think the employees of Lehigh County deserve that. Thank you. and I'm the president and judge of the Court of Common Pleas here. Well, I've been a judge for 27 years on this court, but president and judge only the last two or so years. Each time that I've been here in terms of budget matters, we've talked about a pay study that has yet to materialize. I don't know whether it's the administration's fault or whether it's the commissioner's fault or our fault, but the fact of the matter is this non-existent illusory pay study has been held up as an excuse not to deal with an issue that we've been bringing to your attention and asking for some relief for at least the last three years. Part of this experience, I think, between us has to do with credibility. I just passed out a handout to you. The first page is type of judicial budget. If you look at it, you'll see that for every one of the last five budget years, the judiciary has accepted less money than the year before. A few weeks ago, I came before you and I accepted the administration's request that we reduce our budget by a quarter of a million dollars. I thought we were doing that in return for the reinstatement of the steps on the administration's plan with respect to the non-union compensation. Both the District Attorney Martin and I thank you very much for recognizing that need, and I assumed that that was a done deal. I was shocked when I saw Commissioner Osborne's Amendment Number 18, and then this particular amendment is before us now, which inadequately addresses the issue. And to tell us now that it's a temporary measure that we're still waiting for the pay study is really an inadequate response. And I'd like to show you why. Page number two. <coughs> of the handout is a comparison since 2014 and 2017 of the differences of how the non-union versus the union employees have been treated in terms of compensation. The, the union employees, and I'm talking to the judiciary employees, have had a COLA, a step increase, step increase in a COLA from 2014 through 17, plus 100% of longevity pay in three of those four years, and a 50% longevity pay in one of those four years. 
Compare that to the non-union side of the chart, which is the left side. The non-union employees have gotten a 2% COLA, a 2% COLA, a 2.5% COLA, and a 2.2.5% COLA from 2014 to 15. In terms of how that, in, in addition to that, the non-union employees have had health insurance and prescription costs increased so that they have paid an extra $26 a pay period times 26 pay periods for another $676. That's handout number three. On page four, I will reiterate what I said before about how the non-union employees are treated. We cannot get our best employees to leave the union and take managerial positions so that we have the best people in our situation to manage our offices. It's particularly acute in the MTJ offices, but it applies elsewhere. In addition to that, as District Attorney March, Martin noted, and, and as also um, Director of General Services for Chain, it affects morale. If you go to the next page, it's a specific example of how this affects our employees. And the example is an adult probation officer, too, who's being offered the position of an adult probation officer supervisor. The pay increase will be $2,550. Sounds pretty good. Until you realize that that employee will take on more responsibility and supervise a unit of adult probation officers, will not get overtime, will lose longevity pay of $2,000, contribute $676 more dollars in order for the health plan, and lose the opportunity for overtime and comp time. When an employee looks at that prospect, they tell us, thank you very much for the offer to be promoted, but I'm not taking the job. It doesn't pay. Now that makes no sense. For those of you who think you have a sense of business, recognize that our important asset are our employees. We don't manufacture anything. We don't sell anything. We service. We service people. And, and we service people with people. We need competent people. We're a big business. We're a complicated operation. We have a lot of obligations that are imposed upon us by law and by the reality of what goes on in our community. And I have to say that Lehigh County does a good job of servicing its people. We rarely get sued. We rarely get criticized. We don't have the kinds of really unpleasant experiences that many other counties across the state have because they have bad employees. We work hard at it. And a lot of that is to the credit of our managers. We try to have the best people in the position to manage our employees. You cannot discourage us from hiring and, and promoting our best people. I started the first slide by talking about credibility. We manage our people. We run our departments. I'm asking you to take into account the fact that we know our people. We know our problems. We want to promote the best people, and we need your help to give us the tools to enable us to do that. You haven't done that. You haven't done that because we have people in our offices that are not taking these positions. We're not getting the best people that we can get. Amendment number 20, the one that's before us right now, it increases the pay scale from I thought it was eight steps, but I see the amendment says nine to 12 steps. 12 steps, frankly, is better in rehabilitation than it is here in this discussion. There's a 2.25% increase per step. Under this plan, and I'm looking at page number six of the handout, it will take 11 years for an employee to reach step 12 and receive a 24.75% in salary increases. Under the current pay scale, that is the administration plan, it will take seven years for an employee to reach the top step and receive 26% in salary increases. This Amendment 20 is an improvement over nothing, but it's not what the administration proposes, 
and frankly, it's not enough. We're willing to go back to the administration pay scale, accept the proposed amendment, and wait for this pay stuff. And then let's have something objective that we can talk about. But the expectation has been raised throughout the workforce that the administration's proposal will be accepted. And we can live with that on a short-term basis. And I don't know what the pay study is going to show. I wouldn't be surprised if it raises some really difficult issues for all of us. But fair enough, at least we will have some objective basis that we can sit down and talk about. Right now, we don't. And I don't understand why three years later we don't have it. But I'm tired, frankly, and our employees are tired, of having this illusory pay study thrown up and saying that, wait for the pay study, or alternatively, we're going to come up with a plan for one year, we're going to now change this whole structure for one year, and come back and sit down and negotiate something else. I, I don't understand it. I don't know what the agenda is, and I really don't. I'm not particularly interested in in what the agenda is. I want to run a good judicial system. I want the tools that we can take our best employees and put them in the positions of highest responsibility. So when I ask for credibility, we've come to you for the last five years in a responsible fashion to work with you. We've reduced our budget every one of those years. Now I'm asking you for your consideration in terms of what we think we need to run our operation. I've asked you to reject this amendment, and I'm asking you to accept the proposal by the administration, and let's get on with it. The pay study doesn't happen in a year, it doesn't happen in two years, at least we've got something that's somewhat reasonable that we can move forward on, and at least try to encourage our employees to stay with us and accept more difficult and more responsible positions. I want to also say that uh, one other thing, and that is I know you have another meeting scheduled for next Wednesday uh, with regard to the budget, at least that's how I understand the calendar. Uh, court Administrator uh, Kerry Churzo and I will not be available next Wednesday evening. The Chief Justice of Pennsylvania uh, has invited uh, uh, Kerry and me to be one of only three teams in Pennsylvania to go to a conference in St. Louis it's put on by the National Center for State Courts and the National Association of Professional Court Administrators. Two of the topics that are going to be discussed at this conference are no cash bail, which we talked about two weeks ago when I was here, and also mental health issues and how it affects the courts, something that I've been trying really hard to try to make some difference on. I would ask as a matter of courtesy to carry and to that if this pay issue is not resolved tonight, that it not be sprung on us on Wednesday, next Wednesday, when neither he nor I are here. Uh, the order point to four, uh, next Wednesday is only if we do not finish tonight. And it, it looks like by the hour, we will get through everything tonight. Well, I would hope so, but I, uh, I'm not as conversant with your internal procedures, uh, so I don't, I don't assume anything, uh, Mr. Doctor. All I'm asking is that if the issue is not resolved, that it not be sprung on next Wednesday and give uh, Carrie or me an opportunity to address the substance of whatever it is that, that may be on the table, if, if in fact anything is on the table next Wednesday. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, the, the next speakers, um, if there's a substantively different point, it's going to be please. two minutes. All of you guys. And so, um, my name is Kim McCool. I'm the chief public defender as well as a resident of Lower McCountry Township. And um, District Attorney Martin and I sometimes are on opposite sides in the courtroom. Um, today, I, I think I can say for both of us that we are united. I agree with everything he said. You're not going to hear me say that very often, but I will absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with everything he said 100%. Um, on behalf of, and, and as well with the president judge, and on behalf of not only my office and my employees, but all 
of the employees, all of the non-union employees, we ask that you reject the amendments that are proposed. Thank you. Joe Hillary, Scott Allentown, hopefully somewhat substantively different, but maybe surprisingly not. Um, where to start? I don't know if these numbers are good or not, but let me just be objective and say the following. Non-union and union employees in Lehigh County haven't been like most government jurisdictions employees. Remember after the Great Recession, people were losing their jobs and getting pay cuts while government employees were making eight, nine, ten percent of your pay raises uh, merrily had to be going on. And that was not the case in Lehigh County. Um, that's why I've never made pay a huge deal because again, you got to pay pay the employees. But let's not remember. I keep praising how we do so well on the budget. You know, instead of the budget crisis, huge deficits, we, we do pretty well. That's not just due to management. That's due to the line workers, as we would call them in industry. You know, they're the front line, literally. They're the ones who implement this stuff day to day. And apparently, they take their the money and their jobs seriously because it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of extravagant waste going on. Um, so again, I commend them for that. Yeah, the other thing I would say is we are heading into an inflationary period. I mean, CPI is projected to go up, I believe, two and a half percent in that neighborhood somewhere next year. So again, keeping up with inflation, that's that's all anybody wants at the minimum. Now, if you get promotions and you know other stuff, yeah, you want to get even further ahead. So I, I, I would view this, again, I don't know the details and the numbers, and forgive me, maybe I'm clocking too much time here, but I, I could have sworn I've been hearing about this pay study for four or five years. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, it wasn't officially proposed, but I believe there was discussion about it like the two cycles before. So again, why isn't that done? Um, I think we may see some things we don't like, and we're going to have to deal with it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I also, just like I said with those other amendments, I'm concerned about the process. You don't set pay and policy with a budget amendment. But you got to fix this budget process. How to handle surpluses. They should be locked down. Grant proposals, pay proposals, June 1st maybe. So then the county executive can get a heads up what some of the things you're thinking about. And then he can either massage it into the budget or say no or whatever. Uh, but at least there's time to look at this stuff. So I'm just concerned, but, you know, again, maybe it's necessary. And, you know, labor costs are a big driver of budgets. But um, heading into a, a more inflationary period, I, you know, I wouldn't consider 2.25 good. Uh, you're falling behind. And then if we're not getting quality managers, that is another issue. And again, that's that's where the rubber meets the road for implementing these spending decisions. So I actually would encourage you not to do it this way. Let's get the pay study and have a more formal process with scrutiny. Thank you.
And then we ask them to go above and beyond their normal call of duty, like I did last week with my staff. And not one complaint. We need to reevaluate our pay structure and reward employees for what they do a great job. Thank you. Hartley, High County Controller. I'm going to take this a little different. Uh, the vacancy factor that was passed last year, uh, uh, earlier tonight, the reductions. Just think about that. That's a million dollars in job vacancies. All right? Part of the reason we have vacancies and people leave the county is because of the pay structure. And as people leave, our offices have to retrain, re-educate, Rehire, all cost us money. If you're in business, you don't want to lose employees. You want to keep them. Um, again, as you look at, uh, I've, I've copied you off every single union contract since the Board of Commissioners has taken responsibility for uh, contracts. And out of the 25 years of service uh, to the union contracts, uh, not to begrudge them at all, uh, 17 years out of those 25, the union contract exceeded the non-union contract. Since when did non-union people get less money and compensated less, and they cost <coughs> less? I mean, I don't understand that. So we have two years that they broke even, and only six times, only six times did they exceed, the non-unions exceed the union contracts. And that doesn't even include the longevity, that doesn't include, I'm thank you for bringing that up as far as the, uh, the, the dollars that are spent on health care, higher health care costs. Um, so thank you for your time. Director of Corrections, I'll be very brief with you. I echo the sentiments of my colleagues um, in that I value all my employees, union, non-union, but I cannot thank my non-union staff enough, and it's time someone else did, because they need to be recognized for what they do. It's difficult to promote frontline supervisors when they are recognized less financially and um, longevity and benefits and everything else um, than those that they supervise. And I continue to raise the bar and I continue to, um, they continue to meet that. Um, it, it's time that someone else, and I implore you to reject these, to support the administration, bring back the steps, allow them to have some hope in their future as supervisors and allow me to promote people with experience to run that facility with me. Thank you. Um, just in response to some of the comments, I just wanted to offer uh, just a few remarks, I guess. Um, on the pay steady issue, uh, it was approved as we went through the 2017 budget process lot of conversation leading up to it. There's been a lot of um, issues raised and became clear that the board through this budget process, which is, it seems to be the only time we talk about pay issues, was not the appropriate place for that to occur, which is why we finally got to the point of going through the pay study. But in the course of doing the pay study through no fault of anyone, I don't think, um, there was a lot of transition that occurred since 2017, and the leadership has pointed out. And so I would say that um, there was a lack of focus on that, and the project wasn't moving forward to have such an obvious as time as it could happen. I would say there's been a delay there. But that has been resumed since then. I believe this administration is focused on seeing that it gets done. I'm sure it's taken all the comments that are here, as this board has, that we need to get this moving forward in a timely manner. So I just wanted to share that through no fault of anyone, there were delays, certainly, in getting this case study done, but I believe there's a commitment on the part of the administration, on the part of the board as well, to move that forward in a timely manner so that hopefully we have it 
um, and he just too said they didn't know if he had to put it off, but I think that would be a, a goal there. Um, as far as on the proposed pay plan, the proposed pay scale is not the same as the one that we're using, or it's not, not the same scale we had in 2018. The 2019 pay scale as proposed was changed from the one that we had in 2018. It was changed in that it added in another step on the end and didn't stick with the eight steps that we currently have in the 2018 pay scale um, that is there. So in that sense, it is different, and that's a significant change, I think, in expanding the pay scale out, and what is the basis for that, and where is that information coming from that we're going to decide to do that, I guess. Um, so it wasn't the same as what we had used in the past, and also, there was no conversation. Um, I think the process hasn't been great, as I pointed out. I don't think this is a great conversation to have and that we're discussing um, the appropriate wages for non-union employees during these budget hearings. I think that it would be wonderful if the administration and commissioners could work together in advance of these things coming out um, to determine what an appropriate pay would be. But in this instance, there was no collaboration. I mean, the first I knew that steps were being reinstituted or that there was even the thought of reinstituting steps and not continuing with general wage increases while we waited for the pay stud result was in seeing the proposed budget from the county executive. There was no inclination that we were looking to do this. There was no reaching out to the commissioners to see um, what, what their thoughts would be on this or what they thought of the um, pay scale that had been not used for the, since 2014. And is that appropriate, when you're going back to steps again, is that the appropriate scale to use when you're returning to steps? So it was just, um, I think that that wasn't necessarily a great process to just not have that conversation, which brings us here to once again, back where we've been in past years, and keep complaining about this every year about not sending policy through um, this budget amendment process, but in trying to have a conversation about what we think the appropriate uh, compensation is to put forward in the appropriate compensation package is now here in the amendment process once again. Let's go. Attorney Yes, uh, you stole the words out of my mouth. I really resent that we were dumped upon uh, at the budget time with the uh, County Executive's letter to the employees virtually promising them a pay increase. I, I think that was done poorly. It should have been worked out with the commissioners beforehand. I know as chair of the Finance Committee, I was never approached at all. I knew nothing about it. So it, it caught us uh, unexpectedly. And uh, a couple other things that were mentioned. I, I can't believe that people honestly believe that union and non-union workers should get the same amount of money. I know we have some union people in here tonight, and uh, they belong to a union because they think that they can bargain for a higher increase that way. And also, when we compare union and non-union, remember it is not a good comparison because some of our unions have binding arbitration, which is out of our hands. So some of the increases in workers just uh, logically are going to be higher than those for non-union, even though this may exacerbate uh, people going into uh, uh, unions. Uh, another thing that uh, I sort of recent in terms of this, is in terms of the five-year budget plan, uh, we were more or less told that the administration was looking at a 2% a year uh, increase in uh, salaries, unless I'm mistaken on that. So that was one of the assumptions that we're taking there. So uh, we, we're exceeding that by going back to the full administrative uh, uh, proposal. We, we also, in terms of the pay study, I agree, this is really necessary. But as has been amply pointed out, this is more so 
for administrators in these offices than for some of the, uh, the workers. Uh, that we've added to uh, financing for 2019. I don't see how we don't end up uh, with some, some rating decreases and interest rate increases as a result of that. Um, I don't think anybody wants to be in a situation where we have to raise taxes. taxes. But when we're talking about the investment, meeting the commitment that we've made to invest in Cedar Road to the tune of $70 million, that investment, that commitment, comes with some hard numbers. And those hard numbers necessitate actions to, to fulfill our obligation. Um, so I'm going to oppose this amendment because if we don't uh, act on the, the millage increase this year, we're looking at a millage increase that exceeds what's being proposed in another year. Mr. Yes, uh, I am still going to support this after all the scare tactics that we've heard, and uh, I, I have a, a great deal of respect for Mr. Reeves and his projections, but projections are projections, and I have been duped so many times in the past that we are going to have a tax increase if you don't do this, don't do that, and uh, we always hear that, and we always end up with a fund balance at the end of the year. I know eventually that is going to run out. We are going to have to pay the piper sometime, but I don't think it's this year's budget that we're looking at. Commissioner Dockery, Commissioner Gramps, thank you, Mr. Chilton. I too would like to thank Mr. Reeves. I've had hours and hours of discussions with him, asking some questions, and every time he gives me one answer, just like many others up here, we have another question. Um, talking with some of the fellow commissioners, I think we we have to really get a grip on this amendment. We, we don't really know what our expenses are. I mean, we have a new budget before us. We have something that's out there that we just received several months ago. I've heard talk with Commissioner Osborne about a strategic plan, and I see that's a way to get us where we want to go. We need to look at that, and, and, and I know the work that you want that particular detail, because I think we're going to find things out as we move forward. Uh, and I agree with Commissioner Brown. I think somewhere down the line, there's going to be an adjustment that's going to have to be made. It's a matter of how much and finding the right number and doing everything we can along the way to work for the citizens of Lehigh County. I can tell you that if I, would go, I was out there, just as many of us were in the past several weeks, and saying, you know what, there's a possibility that there's going to be a tax increase. And you know what the answer was that I got? Mark, we trust you to do the right thing. The trust that the people place in us as commissioners is overwhelming. They put us here for a reason, and it's not a Republican or a Democrat. Or people, well, a lot of people aren't even registered to vote. You know, those are the people that we represent. And I think we owe it to the to, to those people, uh, not only the ones that voted for us to put us here, but to everybody that we represent not only in our district, but throughout the county, to make a good uh, decision that's well thought out. Not just when we see the budget for the first time, but everybody talks about it, working on the budget from day one starts with a strategic plan. And uh, uh, so along those lines, uh, I think there's a lot of good ideas that should be put in place at the earliest possible convenience. So for those reasons, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Any public comment? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I refuse to be part of kicking the can when it came to LCA, and I'm going to refuse to be part of kicking the can down the road here with this military. I have to disagree with Commissioner Ramis, I absolutely think this is partisan. I think that this is not about commissioners doing what's best for the county and about them serving the people in the role that they currently hold. I think this is about people in their re-election cycles, report admin, controller, state rep, and Congress. 
This is about people not wanting to increase half food before or during their race, and I think it's deplorable. I won't support this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dean Browning. I reside in South Whitehall Township. Seems like that every seven to eight years or so, the financial situation of Lehigh County reaches a point where the administration presents the Board of Commissioners with a budget that calls for a tax increase. Tonight is one of those nights where you guys earn your exorbitant salary as you consider <laughs> Amendment 17. As you're going through that, though, I'd like to give you some, point, some thoughts for context and specifics as you consider this. After the last tax increase, which went into effect by the call back in 2010, there were several folks that ran for this board promising to do three things. One, completely eliminate the tax increase, which happened to be 16% at that time. They promised to reduce spending, and they promised to pass budgets that were balanced. <laughs> It is now eight years later, and none of those promises have been kept. I say that not to criticize those who failed to fulfill uh, what they set out to do. On the contrary, they were a number of bright, talented, capable people who clearly had clear objectives that they worked hard on, yet they could not be achieved. I believe that is due to several systemic factors that I think you need to take into consideration as you're considering Amendment 17. First is the basic fiscal structure that all governments rely on property taxes operating under. That is, the cost of operating government grows with inflation and population growth, whereas the revenue component is immune to inflation and is only loosely correlated to population growth. Secondly, and related to that, Delivering the services provided by the county is a labor-intensive business. That constitutes a very large component of the county costs that are covered by real estate property taxes. It's been a number of years since I set up there, but off the top of my head, I, my calculation is that roughly 70 to 75 percent of the dollars that the property tax dollars that are spent go to gross wages and benefits for the employees. So unless you match revenue reductions with real spending reductions and take steps to control employee compensation by either reducing the number of employees or reducing how you compensate them, you have a repeating cycle which inexorably leads to the point where you are with the budget of 2019. As an example, from the chart that I just handed out, and there are copies in the back if anyone is interested, the seeds for the tax increase in 2010 were sown back in the fall of 2005 when taxes were cut without any real corresponding reduction in spending. Subsequently to that, wages increased and benefits increased, primarily driven by union contracts. And that trend was exacerbated by using reserves to cover the growing gap between expenses and revenue. I should note that much the same thing that can be said for the county budget since 2015. As an aside, I think it's important to note that once the decision is made to go down the path of authorizing overspending and using reserve funds to balance the budget, indicates that another tax increase is all but certain once those reserve funds dwindle beyond a certain point. Approving budgets where you plan to spend more than you take in, and then hoping for the best, even if that happens, is simply not sound fiscal policy. I know you talked about that year in and year out the county does better than budget, and I think Commissioner Osborne mentioned the past six years. If you go back to 2013, the Board of Commissioners <laughs> authorized the administration to spend roughly $7 million more than they took it in revenue. And guess what? That's exactly what the administration did. If you believe that balanced budgets are really the linchpin to avoiding future tax increases and properly matching revenue to expenses, the question is why do we fail as a board to deliver that? As I see it, the problem is that the current system is not set up to start with that, with a budget that is truly balanced. Section 704A of the Home Rule Charter calls for the budget to be balanced, but it allows the balancing to be accomplished by using both the total of estimated income and cash reserves. 
Changing that, in my mind, is really the starting point that you need to focus on to allow you to have a level playing field going forward. If you pass Amendment 17, which I would suggest that you do, I would suggest that you also take steps to address the systemic problem that leads you to the situation that you're in. As it is, you're presented with a budget that has been agreed to by everyone else in the county government. It has an operating deficit, and it also has a tax increase. So your options at this point are limited. You can make changes at the margin, which is what you're trying to be doing with Amendment 18 by eliminating the steps and cutting $207,000. Or you can make changes and engage in minutia, such as changing the funding source of a $15,000 expenditure at a $500 million budget. Or you can send the budget back and ask for no tax increase. And in essence, that's what Amendment, Amendment 17 is doing, sending the budget back with no tax increase. Again, I would suggest that you pass Amendment 17, but I would also suggest that you take steps to propose a balanced budget amendment, amendment to the Home Rule Charter that would prohibit the use of tax reserves to balance the budget for future budgets. It would require that budget expenses not exceed budgeted revenue, period. The amendment would also include an exception allowing for the use of reserves in emergencies or to give a credit to taxpayers providing the underlying budget is still balanced. Those exceptions would require an affirmative vote of six commissioners. Having a budget that is truly balanced from the start before it is presented to the Board of Commissioners is, in my opinion, a key component needed to avoid the type of exercise that you're going through tonight and will give you a clear starting point to decide whether a tax increase is appropriate or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to comment on that. Um, first of all, Dean, as always, very articulate, and uh, you made some very good points, and I thank you for that. The problem that I see with us considering, even considering a balanced budget amendment is this. It's because we don't have a good track record of estimating expenses versus revenue. In fact, I just pointed out, where in the last six years, we averaged $7.5 million favorable variance. So the problem is this year, just let's take 2019 as it was proposed to this board. With, with the fund balance being proposed of going down from $25 million, this is the stabilization fund, down to approximately $19.6 million, we would have to raise taxes based on this budget if we were to have a balanced budget amendment by almost 10% this year. That would be okay if we had better handle on expenses than we do today. Otherwise, what's going to continue to happen is taxes will go up, taxes will go up, taxes will go up, as we continue to, to fill the offers. One last comment, and then I'll stop. I've been on the board six years, six budget years. This is the seventh budget year. Our board has, over the years, cut taxes, provided rebates to everyone. And yet, at the end of every fiscal year, audited, we ended up with $25 million in stabilization fund just where we started, even with the projections that were dire at times. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Osborne. Public comment, please. The only one for me, ma'am. I'm going to not speak as articulately as Browning, but just as a layman kind of resident of the I County who's very, very tired at this point. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me to have such a huge capital, you know, capital expenses going on and to reduce the millage rate. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. No way we have to do an rate increase anyway. In my personal opinion, personally, I know it's always easier for my family budget have small incremental raises rather than one huge one. So if you're going to do it, certainly do it incrementally. And don't, and don't, it just, and, and obviously this is an election year, let's face it. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to point fingers, but it really seems kind of shady. So that's all. Uh, 
and the rotor meets the road. I watched this board for seven years bipartisanize offer a lot of good fiscal common sense moves. Now when it came down to actually cutting taxes, it was a bit of a divide. But I saw this board implement a lot of good ideas that had fiscal impacts. I agree with Mr. Browning about some sort of new structure on how to deal with it. So let's start with what I mentioned at the committee here. 2014, $10.2 million deficit, actually $1.7 million surplus. 2015, $5.4 million deficit, actually a $3.6 million surplus. 2016, $6.5 million deficit, $2.8 million surplus. And last year, $10.8 million deficit proposed. $1.6 million surplus. My back in the envelope, the calculation tells me over those four years, we accumulated $10 million in surpluses. Where's that money? That should be put in a unspendable fund, and this board should determine what to do with that money. Maybe you move it into capital and move towards cash and carry. Maybe you use it as a tax cut or a tax credit. Maybe you fund long-term post-employment benefits with that money. I, I seem to think the, the administration can just spend it on what they want. No, that wasn't in the budget. Could that even be a misallocation of funds? That might be interesting to look into. So again, this is crisis budgeting. I've used the term before. School districts use it all the time. Oh, we're gonna have to eliminate the third grade and 100 teachers because we're gonna have a 20 million dollar deficit. We gotta raise your taxes and they end up with a nice big huge surplus. It's budgeting by crisis. We have not touched, uh, contrary to Mr. Browning, we did not touch one dollar of the stabilization fund all those years. It was doom and gloom. Not one dollar. I'll read it again for those who want to make that argument. A $5.5 million underwrite transfer from the stabilization fund to the operating fund did not occur. 2017 audit page nine. Same kind of statement in 2016, 2015, 2014. I'll compile them all for you. This is crisis budgeting. Taxes don't have to go up. I keep talking about the natural growth of property tax revenue. What is that number? 2% a year, 3% a year? And to correct something else Mr. Browning said, I'll gladly show him my work. This board with those four tax cuts when you account for the prior 50% assessment and, and normalize everything, at 3.64 mills, you achieved the lowest millage rate in over 25 years. Not only did you roll back the Cunningham Browning tax hike, you rolled back Republican Jane Irvin's tax hike. Because he's valid on that point, the spending merrily continued, but she realized then she was in political trouble after her 60% tax hike. So how is this county getting by? I said it before. Have you driven around compared to 25 years ago? You're bringing in record property tax revenue and it's growing every year. I bet you for 15, 20 years, we saw double digit revenue growth per mill. You have the lowest millage rate in 25 years. That's a heck of an achievement. That's what's going on here. Some people want to wipe out that with a stroke of a pen by claiming a crisis. Frankly, I don't know why that's not being trumpeted all over the county. It was a phenomenal achievement. So both those tax hikes have been rolled back. And this is not a tax cut. It's just saying we're, we're not going to raise taxes with a stroke of a pen and wipe out that phenomenal achievement. So who's really being political here? Jeez. It's funny, one side is political, the other side is noble and never political. It's because it all boils down to you don't need the money. Just like the $5 car tax. It's been proven you don't need the money. The municipalities are sitting on millions of dollars in liquid fuels funds they don't even spend. So, I'm sorry, support this amendment. Because who is being political? You know, the first tax cut proposed, I sat here and listened to the doom and gloom. One of the commissioners said, I hate to have to shut the prison down and watch all the criminals run through the streets of Lehigh County. 
The next year I came to the podium and I said, did I miss the 69 news reports in the morning fall articles about the prison shutting down and the criminals running free through the streets? It's budgeting by crisis to justify an ever more money grab that's not necessary. Because if they grab this money, you're going to have a deficit projected for next year because they're just going to spend it. Do not raise taxes. The day may come, and when I say, you know what, we may need to bump the tax rate up, I mean, everybody's going to have a freaking heart attack on both sides of the aisle. But I'm a realist. You don't need the money now. And we do need to get better projections. And we need a process to lock down those $10 million of surpluses. If I, where is it going? Where is it disappearing? It was projected to be 3.3 at the end of last year. Audits is 1.6. The stabilization fund is only $100,000 higher. Where did that 1.6 million go? Thank you. Thank you. my name is Don Harrington. I live in San Hello, Mr. Litta. I moved here about 15 months ago from Minnesota, where we elected a professional wrestler to be our governor. I can <laughs> And <laughs> when there was a budget surplus, he uh, he pushed the legislators to give it to give it all to give it all to the taxpayers. A yeah, huge tax. Uh, Relief. And then the governors who followed him uh, were in trouble. And instead of raising taxes, which you know, modest, they, they, they took the tobacco settlement that came to the state of Minnesota, they took reserve funds, and they were able to get by. But the succeeding years got darker and darker and darker. I appreciate the work that you do. I also appreciate the work that your county staff does. And looking at that five-year <coughs> projection, I would uh, I would put more uh, value in it than uh, than some of you do, and I would agree with the comment that was made before that um, <coughs> that I would rather have uh, smaller increases than, than a huge one. If that if you're looking at a ten percent one or something like that a couple of years, I'd rather have you raise it. What you are doing is restoring where this county was in 2014, the, the millage rate. I hope you will do that. You're restoring. You're not, I mean, yes, you're raising taxes, but you're restoring what was. And, uh, and so I would speak against uh, Amendment 17 and, and ask you to, uh, to go with the budget. Thank you. Hi, I'm Annette Carr, the High County Controller. I'm just not going to speak on this, but I can't go by without uh, correcting some falsehoods that were just made. Uh, Lehigh County used to be assessed at 50%. Thus, the tax rate was, the millage was set at 14. And when we reassessed it to 100%, it dropped to 7. Yeah, my record was on it. Yeah. So 14 would be 14, the same as it was. Half of 7, half of 14 is 7. 50%, 100%. Well, there was absolutely no reduction in uh, tax cuts that wiped out all those tax cuts for all those years. Dave Perilla can, uh, Clerk Perilla can find the legislation. I'm sure the fiscal officer can show you that the revenues were neutral and the millage rate is exactly the same as it was uh, a decade and a half ago. So it's just, you can't just go saying things that aren't true and say you gotta do with your home. I did get a four cash cuts. Four three point six four bills. So Armstrong County Executive. Um, I'm gonna start by saying very, very honestly, doing a five hundred and six million dollar budget for me, being my first one. My son even said, Dad. You were a department head, but what do you know about $506 million budget? And I said, you're absolutely correct. That's why, and I agree with the gentleman from Minnesota, we have a staff here, CPAs, 30 years experience. They and myself sat with every department and listened to every department's needs. We then looked at, because the Board of Commissioners requested five years. And yes, we, we agree. We could probably go this, this budget 
without an increase. But all we're doing by that is ignoring the future. And I wish this wasn't a political thing. I think this is just a case of numbers. And I put so much faith in Tim and his department. And I asked him to do the projections. What will happen if we don't do it now? And we're looking at a 10%, 12% increase. So it's just that, you know, it's like the old commercial with the car broke down, pay me now or pay me later. You do the oil change to keep the car running, or before you know it, your engine locks up. He sat down today and explained to me that 75% of our budget are fixed costs. 75% of those expenses equal $112 million. That's exactly what this tax rate would bring in. I would love to say to you that we would never have to do that. That would be the most popular thing for me to say. Let's never ever. And we, uh, to be honest with you, we did projections. If it had stayed at 3.79, we could go to 2023 and still be the best funded county in the state. But that's history. We can't do that because it was lowered back. And I can't go back to that. I'd love to, and I would have begged never to, people were used to paying this, if you kept it there, the surplus we have now for our bond rating, for money towards Cedar Brook, would be fantastic. That's water under the bridge. We're dealing with what's going on right now. And very, very strongly, the administration, with the support of our fiscal <coughs> department, the numbers just don't work. Down in 2020, 2021, we're taking four and a half million dollars out of our projected revenue if we take this tax back down. And that is really going to kick, the, kick us back in the future. And I can't face the people of the county telling them that I didn't do what was right today. So I am firmly against that amendment. Thank you. Chris Walker from uh, South Whitehall. Uh, I'd like to echo the comments made by the gentleman from Minnesota. Uh, I'd be much more comfortable having modest increases in taxes rather than get hit by a large increases in taxes. And um, I also, I think the last speaker, our executive just said, pay me now or pay me later. I think the situation is likely to be pay me now or pay me more later. I'd rather have you be truly conservative on this issue and do what makes sense at the current time. I would uh, reject this amendment. Thank you, Chris. Commissioner Holt. Last year, a proposal was brought forward to improve the cash flow of the county annually by $4 million without requiring the cash increase to make this improvement. And the administration and the majority of the board did not see the necessity of doing this. So now the board is hearing the opposite, that a $4 million annual cash flow improvement is necessary. With 75% of our costs fixed, the question I'm asking myself is what changed in a year? because 75% of our costs are fixed. And so when I'm struggling with reconciling these two vastly different recommendations in such a short period of time, I really do agree with the comments that were made earlier about the need for strategic planning, because I think that it doesn't make sense when you get two recommendations like this that are so completely opposite. And so that's why I'm going to be supporting that because we need to look more into this to see what, what Really Mr. Clerk, will you please call a roll call vote for amendment number 17? Commissioner Osborne? Yes. Commissioner Zanelli? No. Commissioner Briggs? No. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Dockey? Yes. Commissioner Gramis? Yes. Commissioner Nostein? Yes. Commissioner Hartzell? No. And Commissioner Holt? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I recorded six votes in favor and three votes opposed. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Uh, we're going to change up the order of the amendments. Uh, I would like to have 
Mr. Clerk, introduce amendment number 20, please. Amendment number 20. It will provide pay scales for non-union employees. Pay scale 9 for non-union employees is changed from closed 9 steps to 12 steps. There's a conversion chart to take employees from the 2018 step to the 2019 step. Each future step represents a 2.25 increase in salary. Employees at the top of the pay scale receive a lump sum payment of 2.25% and their base pay is not increasing. Non-union nursing managers on pay scale 6 do not, do not increase to a fifth step. They receive a lump sum payment of 2.25% and their base pay is not increasing. This also impacts the sheriff's union part-timers who receive 2.25 and not 2.5. Uh, PSS, the PSSU meet discuss unit, pay scale 15, who receives 2.25 and not 2.5. And non-classified service employees on pay scale 16 uh, would receive 2.25 and not 2.5 percent. Mr. Chairman, the scale itself is attached to the amendment as Exhibit 20A. The, uh, within the text of the amendment is the uh, conversion chart that shows the 18 step or the current step to 2019. The savings from this change estimated are, are estimated at $200,000 and will be removed from the appropriate personnel line items. And the transfer to the operating fund from the stabilization fund is decreased by an estimated $200,000. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. <coughs> we have a motion for amendment number 20. Yes. So, motion by Mr. Commissioner Holt, second by Commissioner Docker. Foster comments, please. Um, I think it was pretty accurately summarized. Um, this proposes a new pay scale of 2.25% step to provide employees with a step increase, or um, as with the standard step system, those at the top of the scale will receive a lump sum in lieu of a step. These steps are more in line with recent wage increases at the county, the five year average general wage increase that has been given out over the last. Employees under this proposal are moved to the step above the one which most closely matches their current pay. And transitioning to the new pay scale, employees would receive a wage increase between 2.25% and 4.1%. The average wage increase is 2.7% in 2019. Um, I consider this pay scale to be transitional change until we have the additional information available through the completion of the case study. I do feel it is important to um, at least do something to try and address those that have been at that step one for so long without any kind of step movement, but I do not feel it's appropriate to reinstitute the step system we had without the, um, in the absence of the information we're looking to get from the, the pay study to make a more informed decision, I view this as a transitional change to use until we can get there and make a final decision. I'll defer to my co-sponsor Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. Commissioner Dougherty. Yes, thank you. Uh, I hate steps. I, I really hate them because in my past life, I was a teacher and I saw how steps at, at that institution were 5%. They rewarded the people at the top of the step so much more than the people at the bottom. But I think it's also very unfair that when we had negotiations with the sheriff's union, one poor guy on the committee worked here for six years and was still getting the same salary as someone coming in. So I think people who have experience need to have steps. So I am all for having steps until we can find some better way. I've had discussions with other people, and I, I even look at the possibility of uh, putting in an amendment for, uh, especially for the row officers. I mentioned this to uh, B.A. Martin when he appeared before the Finance Committee, that I thought that uh, he was better able to make the pay increases in his own department. I think that we should find a way 
where we can get a merit-based system where department heads can spread the money out rather than having everybody at the same staff. That seems like everybody has the same expertise, but I do think that people who have been here on the job deserve a step increase, and that's why I am supporting this at this time until we can get a pay study done. Thank you, Mr. Doctor. Any other commissioner comments? Any public comments? <laughs> Oh, thank you, Commissioner Nostein, for moving this up in the order. <laughs> I thought you were moving to first, not on exactly Jackson 19. Um, let, me, let me say, I, you know, I trust the commissioners. I, I, I do. I trust them and have confidence in the commissioners uh, when they're um, navigating through uh, the challenges of union negotiations. I believe uh, you're representing the, uh, the county taxpayer as well as the, uh, the union staff and the value that we receive in those contracts. Um, you know, the collaboration that you show uh, during those negotiations, I believe, um, is the reason why we have successful labor relations here in the county of Lehigh. Um, but I have a disappointment. I have lots of disappointments, but the disappointment that I want to talk about tonight is the non-union staff. And um, the fact is, this year, and I'm going to speak collectively, not individually, uh, the union increases for the county of Lehigh at 3.2%. We don't hear anything tonight about saving money or adjusting the union contracts to represent uh, a potential real or not real need to save $200,000. What's being proposed this evening by the commissioners uh, is reducing the non-union salary um, to 2.25 or 2.5 or quite honestly 12 steps or whatever the step program is. And then I hear, hey, you know what, it's only going to be transitional because we're doing a study and that study's going to give us advice. So we're going to sit back and we're going to make changes to the bureaucracy of our county's pay system. For one year, it makes no sense, commissioners. It makes no sense to me. For 10 years, our union staff has averaged 1% more than the non-union staff. So I'm happy that Commissioner uh, Holt pointed out that our average uh, um, uh, salary increases were two something. What she didn't tell you was what the average was for the union staff. Do you have that number, Commissioner Holt? It's more than three and a half percent. So, let's talk about the need right now. We have a compensation study on the way. That compensation study, according to our director of HR, will provide us some choices. It's not gonna tell us exactly what to do. It'll give us choices on how to craft a plan, craft a policy for our non-union staff. So, I'm a bit confused how we got these numbers that I heard this evening. Did we stick our finger in the air to check the temperature or check the wind direction? Or worse, did we just come up with a plan because we thought those numbers sounded good? Commissioners, I'm asking you today to reconsider. I believe, I like to represent myself, but tonight I'm representing 800 members of this workforce who are not union. I was going to go into a Mark Randall story about peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> Talk about the white balance. I don't like students. <laughs> <laughs> the white right balance of peanut butter and jelly. But I'm not going to. You know, in business school, you learn about factors of motivation. You know, the number one factor of motivation is what's inside you. It's not pay. It's what's inside you. It's the job that you do. Many of our staff have been doing the jobs that they do and are motivated to do that job because that's what they believe in. It comes from within. So motivation is not managed through pay increase. Man, it's motivated and motivation comes from the work itself. We believe we do important things here in this county. Now, hygiene factors. No, I'm not talking about combing your hair. I'm talking about maintenance factors 
that matter in the workforce. They may not add to motivation, but commissioners, they will absolutely lead towards satisfaction or the opposite, dissatisfaction. The number one reason why employees are dissatisfied is salary. They believe it's important to be paid for what they believe they're worth. The next factor, hygiene factor, very important for creating satisfaction, is policy. And never would it be appropriate for us to have a policy discussion this evening. It seems to me that we missed our opportunities over the last year to talk about policy changes to the payroll system. Commissioners, compensation, bad policy means dissatisfied workers. They're still going to get up and do their jobs because they're motivated, because they're motivated by the job they do. Whether you're in a coroner's office, the controller's office, or the administration, or even your own staff in the commissioner's office. Again, it's not a motivator, but it certainly can create dissatisfaction. Commissioners, if you're studying Hertzberg, he tells you all about hygiene and, and motivation. But look, you got to address ways to stop job dissatisfaction. You've got to fix a poor system. We have a poor system where every year we come before you with a number and you elect to change the number or we walk out of here happy that you didn't for a non-union workforce. Why would we expect our staff to feel comfortable coming tonight and looking at you nine and hoping by some grace of God you will not change the recommended pay scale plan? You've got to stop dissatisfaction. And you've got to figure out ways to create satisfaction. Those are things like Commissioner Graham has mentioned tonight. Things like achievement, recognizing, rewarding, advancement. Those are things that really matter and create satisfaction. But look, you can't get anywhere to create satisfaction or create and maintain motivation if you're not directing the needs to the most basic hygiene, which is compensation. Without compensation, we will not achieve rewarding. I heard somebody earlier tonight said, I don't want a pen, I'd rather have pay. Commissioners, um, I, I believe that person is probably correct. And he would fit exactly what every study as it relates to human resource management will tell you. Reduce dissatisfaction, create satisfaction, hire motivated people. Look, basic needs, salary, security needs, benefits, belongingness needs, cooperation, esteem needs, respect and recognition, and then ultimately, self-actualization. When I believe I'm an expert and I'm asked to represent an expert opinion, that makes me feel good. That's how you move the workforce forward. Not the second Wednesday of October, we placed a non-union staff on some kind of a, a spinning wheel and decide how to manage policy. Commissioners, all leaders in every business want to develop a successful workforce. It's how you win. Our policy uh, presented by the executive um, for, for this year does include returning to steps. But commissioners, I think the benefit of doing the model as we know it is that our bureaucratic system here in the county doesn't need to make any additional changes. We can make that happen as we await the compensation plan. Look, uh, I'd like you to maintain the administration's plan, which is a collective 3.1% increase to the non-union workforce. Commissioners, if you're really serious about our workforce, um, you gotta create time uh, to learn. Uh, it takes us as, as directors or managers or role officers 365 days a year, 365 days a year working with our people. Not 26 days a year. 365 days managing our workforce, both union and non-union. Finally, make a good decision. The workforce is watching. 
We're not going to be more motivated tomorrow because we believe in what we do, but we can be more satisfied. <clears throat> Thank you, but again, please take the appropriate action tonight. Um, vote down both of the amendments before you. Um, our non-union staff will believe that you are working to close that gap that we've created the last 10 years. So commissioners, I know there's others that would like to speak. Um, I'm asking you to consider the amendments and vote no. Employees who, for the last 
six weeks have been thinking they're going to get the reinstitution of the steps and a 2.5% increase. Now look, let's look for a moment at what this budget does, or these proposed amendments do. The amendment that's before you returns an estimated $200,000 to the stabilization fund. That's less than one-tenth of one percent of the tax, county tax dollars portion of the budget, the $112 million. Do you, do you really think that's worth it? And if you look at, at Commissioner Osborne's, that's slightly over two-tenths of one percent. Really? You know, you, you've got a workforce, it's a terrific workforce, they ought to be compensated fairly. I pointed out to you when I was before you, and I, I gave you a portion of a letter that I addressed to the executive. I've got, and I'm not going to get into the names, but I've got four assistant district attorneys who are in the first step. One of them has been in the first step for four and a half years, making exactly the same as an employee who was hired a year ago, making exactly the same as an employee who was hired in April of this year, making exactly the same as an employee who was hired in July of this year, and making a few thousand dollars less than an employee that came over in a lateral move two years ago. Now, is that fair? And neither, not, neither the, the executive's proposal or Commissioner Armstrong's proposal or Commissioner Dockin and Commissioner Holt's proposal is going to cure that. But it needs to be cured. And, and that's why I think you know, the pay study has a great deal of merit. But let's get on with it. It's been three years. Employees were denied any raise at all, by my recollection, on the premise that the pay study was going to take place. And it hasn't. And the people who are driving that, except for one, are going to be gone by the end of this year. Two of them are already gone. So you're going to have to start a new, and you've got another phase of a pay study that has to come into play. So I'm going to ask you to consider, please, not passing either of these amendments and keeping in intact the administration's proposal, because I think the employees of Lehigh County deserve that. Thank you. My name is Ed Reedman. Uh, I live in Lower McCungie Township, and I'm the president and judge of the Court of Common Pleas here. Uh, I've been a judge for 27 years on this court, but president judge only the last two or so years. Each time that I've been here, in terms of budget matters, we've talked about a pay study that has yet to materialize. I don't know whether it's the administration's fault, or whether it's the commissioner's fault, or our fault, but the fact of the matter is this non-existent illusory pay study has been held up as an excuse not to deal with an issue that we've been bringing to your attention and asking for some relief for at least the last three years. Part of this experience, I think, between us has to do with credibility. I just passed out a handout to you. The first page is titled Judicial Budget. If you look at it, you'll see that for every one of the last five budget years, the judiciary has accepted less money than the year before. A few weeks ago, I came before you and I accepted the administration's request that we reduce our budget by a quarter of a million dollars. I thought we were doing that in return for the reinstatement of the steps on the administration's plan with respect to the non-union compensation. Both the District Attorney Martin and I thank you very much for recognizing that need, and I assumed that that was a done deal. I was shocked when I saw Commissioner Osborne's Amendment Number 18. And then this particular amendment is before us now, which inadequately addresses the issue. And to tell us now that it's a temporary measure 
that we're still waiting for the case study is really an inadequate response. And I'd like to show you why. Change number two. of the handout is a comparison since 2014 and 2017 of the differences of how the non-union versus the union employees have been treated in terms of compensation. The, the union employees, and I'm talking the judiciary employees, have had a COLA, a step increase, step increase in a COLA from 2014 through 17, plus 100% of longevity pay in three of those four years and a 50% longevity pay in one of those four years. Compare that to the non-union side of the chart, which is the left side. The non-union employees have gotten a 2% COLA, a 2% COLA, a 2.5% COLA, and a 2.2.5% COLA from 2014 to 15. In terms of how that, in, in addition to that, the non-union employees have had health insurance and prescription costs increase so that they have paid an extra $26 a pay period times 26 pay periods for another $676. That's handout number three. On page four, I will reiterate what I said before about how the non-union employees are treated. We cannot get our best employees to leave the union and take managerial positions so that we have the best people in our situation to manage our offices. It's particularly acute in the MDJ offices, but it applies elsewhere. In addition to that, as District Attorney March, Martin noted, and, and as also um, Director of General Services Paul Cheney noted, it affects morale. If you go to the next page, there's a specific example of how this affects our employees. And the example is an adult probation officer, too, who's being offered the position of an adult probation officer supervisor. The pay increase will be $2,550. Sounds pretty good. Until you realize that that employee will take on more responsibility and supervise a unit of adult probation officers, will not get overtime, will lose longevity pay of over $2,000, contribute $676 more in order for the health plan, and lose the opportunity for overtime and cop time. When an employee looks at that prospect, they tell us, thank you very much for the offer to be promoted, but I'm not taking the job. It doesn't pay. Now that makes no sense. For those of you who think you have a sense of business, recognize that our important asset are our employees. We don't manufacture anything. We don't sell anything. We service. We service people. And, and we service people with people. We need competent people. We're a big business. We're a complicated operation. We have a lot of obligations that are imposed upon us by law and by the reality of what goes on in our community. And I have to say that Lehigh County does a good job of servicing its people. We rarely get sued. We rarely get criticized. We don't have the kinds of really unpleasant experiences that many other counties across the state have because they have bad employees. We work hard at it. And a lot of that is to the credit of our managers. We try to have the best people in the position to manage our employees. You cannot discourage us from hiring and, and promoting our best people. I started the first slide by talking about credibility. We manage our people. We run our departments. I'm asking you to take into account the fact that we know our people. We know our problems. We want to promote the best people, and we need your help to give us the tools to enable us to do that. You haven't done that. You haven't done that because we have people in our offices that are not taking these positions. We're not getting the best people that we can get. 
Amendment number 20, the one that's before us right now, it increases the face of the bill from, I thought it was eight steps, but I see the amendment says nine to 12 steps. 12 steps, frankly, is better in rehabilitation than it is here in this discussion. There's a 2.25% increase per step. Under this plan, and I'm looking at page number six of the handout, it will take 11 years for an employee to reach step 12 and receive a 24.75% in salary increases. Under the current pay scale, that is the administration plan, it will take seven years for an employee to reach the top step and receive 26% in salary increases. This Amendment 20 is an improvement over nothing, but it's not what the administration proposes, and frankly, it's not enough. We're willing to go back to the administration pay scale, accept the proposed amendment, and wait for this pay stuff. And then let's have something objective that we can talk about. But the expectation has been raised throughout the workforce that the administration's proposal will be accepted. And we can live with that on a short-term basis. And I don't know what the pay study is going to show. I wouldn't be surprised if it raises some really difficult issues for all of us. But fair enough, at least we will have some objective basis that we can sit down and talk about. Right now, we don't. And I don't understand why three years later we don't have it. But I'm tired, frankly, and our employees are tired, of having this illusory pay study thrown up and saying that, wait for the pay study, or alternatively, we're going to come up with a plan for one year, we're going to now change this whole structure for one year, and come back and sit down and negotiate something else. I, I don't understand it. I don't know what the agenda is, and I really don't. I'm not particularly interested in in what the agenda is. I want to run a good judicial system. I want the tools that we can take our best employees and put them in the positions of highest responsibility. So when I ask for credibility, we've come to you for the last five years in a responsible fashion to work with you. We've reduced our budget every one of those years. Now I'm asking you for your consideration in terms of what we think we need to run our operation. I've asked you to reject this amendment, and I've asked you to accept the proposal by the administration, and let's get on with it. The pay study doesn't happen in a year, it doesn't happen in two years, at least we've got something that's somewhat reasonable that we can move forward on, and at least try to encourage our employees to stay with us and accept more difficult and more responsible positions. I want to also say that um, one other thing, and that is, I know you have another meeting scheduled for next Wednesday uh, with regard to the budget, at least that's how I understand the calendar. Uh, Court Administrator uh, Kerry Churchill and I will not be available next Wednesday evening. The Chief Justice of Pennsylvania uh, has invited uh, uh, Kerry and me to be one of only three teams in Pennsylvania to go to a conference in St. Louis it's put on by the National Center for State Courts and the National Association of Professional Court Administrators. Two of the topics that are going to be discussed at this conference are no cash bail, which we talked about two weeks ago when I was here, and also mental health issues and how it affects the courts, something that I've been trying really hard to try to make some difference on. I would ask as a matter of courtesy to carry and to me that if this pay issue is not resolved tonight, that it not be sprung on us on Wednesday, next Wednesday, when neither he nor I are here. Uh, the point to for it, uh, next Wednesday is only if we do not finish tonight. And it, it looks like by the hour, we will get through everything tonight. Well, I would hope so, but I, uh, I'm not as conversant with your internal procedures, uh, so I don't, I don't assume anything, uh, Mr. Doctor. All I'm asking is that if the issue is not resolved, that it not be sprung on next Wednesday and give uh, Kerry and me an opportunity to address the substance of whatever it is that, that may be on the table, if, if in fact anything is on the table next Wednesday. Thank you for your consideration. I, I, I'm 
Uh, the, the next speakers, um, if there's a substantively different point. I'm going to be please. two minutes. All of you guys. And so um, my name is Kim McCool. I'm the chief public defender as well as a resident of Lower McCunji Township. And um, District Attorney Martin and I sometimes are on opposite sides in the courtroom. Um, today, I, I think I can say for both of us that we are united. I agree with everything he said. You're not going to hear me say that very often, but I will absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with everything he said 100% um, on behalf of, and, and as well with the president judge. And on behalf of not only my office and my employees, but all of the employees, all of the non-union employees, we ask that you reject the amendments that are proposed. Thank you. So we look at Staten Island Town, hopefully somewhat substantively different, but maybe surprisingly not. Um, where to start? I don't know if these numbers are good or not, but let me just be objective and say the following. Non-union and union employees in Lehigh County haven't been like most government jurisdictions employees. Remember after the Great Recession, people were losing their jobs and getting pay cuts while well, Government employees were making eight, nine, ten percent of your pay raises. Uh, merrily had to be going on, and that was not the case in Lehigh County. Um, that's why I've never made pay a huge deal because again, you got to pay pay the employees. But let's not remember. I keep praising how we do so well on the budget. You know, instead of the budget crisis, huge deficits, we do pretty well. That's not just due to management. That's due to the line workers, as we would call them in industry. You know, they're the front line, literally. They're the ones who implement this stuff day to day. And apparently they take mo their, the money and their jobs seriously because it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of extravagant waste going on. Um, so again, I commend them for that. Yep. The other thing I would say is we are heading into an inflationary period. I mean, CPI is projected to go up, I believe, 2.5% in that neighborhood somewhere next year. So again, keeping up with inflation, that's... That's all anybody wants at the minimum. Now, if you get promotions and you know other stuff, yeah, you want to get even further ahead. So I, I, I would view this, again, I don't know the details and the numbers, and forgive me, maybe I'm clocking too much time here, but I, I could have sworn yeah, I've been hearing about this case study for four or five years. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, it wasn't officially proposed, but I believe there was discussion about it like the two cycles before. So again, why isn't that done? Um, I think we may see some things we don't like, and we're going to have to deal with it. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I also, just like I said with those other amendments, I'm concerned about the process. You don't set pay and policy with a budget amendment. But you got you to fix this budget process. How to handle surpluses. They should be locked down. Grant proposals, pay proposals, June 1st maybe. So then the county executive can get a heads up what some of the things you're thinking about. And he can either massage it into the budget or say no or whatever. Uh, but at least there's time to look at this stuff. So I'm just concerned, but, you know, again, maybe it's necessary. And, you know, labor costs are a big driver of budgets. But um, heading into a, a more inflationary period, I, you know, I wouldn't consider 2.25 good. We're falling behind, and then if we're not getting quality managers, that is another issue. And again, that's that's where the rubber meets the road for implementing these spending decisions. So I actually would encourage you not to do it this way. Let's get the pay study and have a more formal process with scrutiny. Thank you. <laughs>
On an annual basis, the county spends a lot of money in training and educating our staff. When an employee leaves for a higher paying position, we lose the money, but more importantly, we lose a highly qualified coworker, an individual, a human being. We need to reevaluate our pay schedule, our structures. In the day, my staff, as well as other county coworkers, look forward to receiving their annual performance evaluation, and if they did a good job, they would receive a step increase. Today, our employees do not receive anything for doing a good job. We ask our coworkers to do the best every day and to serve our community with integrity, professionalism, and dedication. And then we ask them to go above and beyond their normal call of duty, like I did last week with my staff, and not one complaint. We need to reevaluate our pay structure and reward employees for when they do a great job. Thank you. Black Park, Lehigh County Controller. I'm going to take this a little different. Uh, the vacancy factor that was passed last year, uh, uh, earlier tonight, the reductions. Just think about that. That's a million dollars in job vacancies. All right? Part of the reason we have vacancies and people leave the county is because of the pay structure. And as people leave, our offices have to retrain, re-educate, rehire. All cost us money. If you're in business, you don't want to lose employees. You want to keep them. Um, again, as you look at, uh, I've, I've copied off every single union contract since the Board of Commissioners has taken responsibility for uh, contracts. And out of the 25 years of service uh, to the union contracts, uh, not to begrudge them at all, uh, 17 years out of those 25, the union contract exceeded the non-union contract. Since when did non-union people get less money and compensated less, and they cost <coughs> less? I mean, I don't understand that. So we have two years that they broke even, and only six times, only six times did they exceed, the non-unions exceed the union contracts. And that doesn't even include the longevity. That doesn't include, I'm thank you for bringing that up as far as the, uh, the, the dollars that are spent on health care, higher health care costs. Um, so thank you for your time. Good evening, Janine Zanotti, Director of Corrections. I'll be very brief with you. I echo the sentiments of my colleagues um, in that I value all my employees, union, non-union, but I cannot thank my non-union staff enough, and it's time someone else did, because they need to be recognized for what they do. It's difficult to promote frontline supervisors when they are recognized less financially and um, longevity and benefits and everything else um, than those that they supervise. And I continue to raise the bar and I continue to, um, they continue to meet that. Um, it, it's time that someone else, and I implore you to reject these, to support the administration, bring back the steps, allow them to have some hope in their future as supervisors and allow me to promote people with experience to run that facility with me. Thank you.
about the transition that occurred since 2017 and the leadership has pointed out. And so I would say that um, there was a lack of focus on that and the project wasn't moving forward perhaps as it, obviously as timely as it could have. But I would say there's been a delay there. But that has been resumed since then. I believe this administration is focused on seeing that it gets done. I'm sure it's taken all the comments that are here as this board has that we need to get this moving forward in a timely manner. So I just wanted to share that through no fault of anyone, there were delays certainly in getting this case study done. But I believe there's a commitment on the part of the administration, on the part of the board as well, to move that forward in a timely manner so that hopefully we have it um, in time for next year's budget and don't see how to put it off. But I think that would be a, a goal there. Um, as far as on the proposed pay plan, the proposed pay scale is not the same as the one that we're using, or it's not, not the same scale we had in 2018. The 2019 pay scale as proposed was changed from the one that we had in 2018. And it was changed in that it added in another step on the end and didn't stick with the eight steps that we currently have in the 2018 pay scale um, that is there. So in that sense, it is different. And that's a significant change, I think, in expanding the pay scale out. And what is the basis for that? And where is that information coming from that we're going to decide to do that, I guess? Um, so it wasn't the same as what we had used in the past. And also, there was no conversation. Um, I think the process hasn't been great, as it pointed out. I don't think this is a great conversation to have when we're discussing um, the appropriate wages for non-union employees during these budget hearings. I think that it would be wonderful if the administration and commissioners could work together in advance of these things coming out um, to determine what an appropriate pay would be. But in this instance, there was no collaboration. I mean, the first I knew that steps were being reinstituted or that there was even the thought of reinstituting steps and not continuing with general wage increases while we waited for the pay study results was in seeing the proposed budget from the county executive. There was no inclination that we were looking to do this. There was no reaching out to the commissioners to see um, what, what their thoughts would be on this or what they thought of the um, pay scale that had been not used for the, since 2014. And is that appropriate, when you're going back to steps again, is that the appropriate scale to use when you're returning to steps? So it was just, um, I think that that wasn't necessarily a great process to just not have that conversation, which brings us here to once again, back where we've been in past years, and we keep complaining about this every year about not setting policy through um, this budget amendment process, but in trying to have a conversation about what we think the appropriate uh, compensation is to put forward in the appropriate compensation package is now here in the amendment process once again. Yes, uh, you stole the words out of my mouth. I really resent that we were dumped upon uh, at the budget time with the uh, County Executive's letter to the employees virtually promising them a pay increase. I, I think that was done poorly. It should have been worked out with the commissioners beforehand. I know as chair of the Finance Committee, I was never approached at all. I knew nothing about it. So it, it caught us uh, unexpectedly. And uh, a couple other things that were mentioned. I, I can't believe that people honestly believe that union and non-union workers should get the same amount of money. I know we have some union people in here tonight, and uh, they belong to a union because they think that they can bargain for a higher increase that way. And also, when we compare union and non-union, remember it is not a good comparison because some of our unions have binding arbitration which is out of our hands so some of the union workers just uh, logically are going to be higher than those for non-union even though this may exacerbate uh, people going into uh, uh, unions uh, another thing that uh, i 
sort of reason in terms of this is in terms of the five-year budget plan, uh, we were more or less told that the administration was looking at a 2% a year uh, increase in uh, salaries, unless I'm mistaken on that. So that was one of the assumptions that we're taking there. So uh, we, we're exceeding that by going back to the full administrative uh, uh, proposal. We, we also, in terms of the pay study, I agree, this is really necessary. But as has been amply pointed out, this is more so for administrators in these offices than for some of the, uh, the workers are really necessary. But as has been amply pointed out, this is more so for administrators in these offices than for some of the, uh, the workers, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the union workers have uh, caught up and bypassed uh, the administrators. So that's becoming a, a major problem there. So we've got to get the pay study done to make sure that our administrators are getting the proper salaries. And uh, in, in terms of uh, the salaries, I, I've always been a firm believer in benchmarking. And I, I would love to see what the other third class counties are paying for workers and for unions and for the administrators. And we're only going to find that out when this case study is done. I know we have been promising this for so long, but I think the change in administration uh, <coughs> is a little lack of emphasis for that. But I hope now that we have the administration firmly in place that we will start moving forward with this with all dispatch. So I could go on and on and on, but that, that's all I have to say right now. But I, I think it, it's important that we get the steps back so we can give the employees the pay increases so that they're not all getting the same salary as people who are just coming in. May I respond real quickly to one thing Commissioner Holt pointed out? I think it's fair to say that the ninth step that was added was done so because step increases were done away with in 2013. That's six years The people on the eighth step have gotten no increase by way of merit. I mean, nobody's gotten an increase by way of merit. But in order to pump them up above just a, a cost of living adjustment, which is what they've gotten, you know, you had to add another step. And one other point, is that when you, when you talk about a lump sum payment, which one of these amendments talks about, that, that doesn't do anything for that particular employee's pension because it's not recognized as a pension contribution. Thank you, Chairman Ostein. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking Attorney Martin, President Judge, and Freeman, Public Defender, Cubicle, Foreigner, and everyone else who spoke this evening. I really, and I mean that, I really do appreciate it. Um, so I'd like to add just some um, words to the conversation, and to me it is a conversation, because I'm gonna end with something. I did not ask our chairman to move my amendment back behind this one that we're discussing in front of us now. But I'm glad he did, because my intention was never to supplant the topic that we're talking about and trying to bring, introduce something different to change the subject. I want to stay on the subject. And one of the things that I feel is that everyone in this room knows that I ran for county executive. So I know that there was approximately 2,000 employees and now this year a budget of almost $500 million. And I have a sense of fairness to, to employees. And they need to be rewarded. The step system is something that is not uncommon in government structures. I don't have an objection to it. I don't know that it's the best way to compensate good performing employees, but I don't have an objection to it if that's what we want. 
But here's what I saw as the problem and the reason why I introduced this amendment. I introduced this amendment last Friday. I knew there was conversation among our board members, and I think deservedly and rightfully so, about some of the perceived issues with what was presented in the budget. So what I did was, as a last resort, put in this amendment, not knowing what else we might be considering. But let me go a little bit further. I have a problem with what's been proposed by the executive. I don't have a criticism. I just have a problem with it. I have a problem with this amendment that we're talking about here. And here's my problem that I see with it. I see a pay scale that is not, I think, for employees. Let me back up a step. We need to be fair and consistent. What is being proposed, in my view, isn't fair. And it's not fair because one of the steps gets 5%, another one gets more than 6%, and the interim steps get less than 3%. I don't understand how that is a good way to set a policy. Also, something that is maybe not known widely is that in five-year financial projection, which the administration calls a plan, so this is what they plan to do next year and every succeeding year in the five-year projection, you know what they have for employee non-union compensation? 2% in each of the following four years. I'm not sure what that means. I don't think I like it, though. It means we're going to say what I think is an imperfect thing and unfair, and we're going to do it for one year. Well, I pointed out, you know, I've got a guy with four years' experience who's handling the order for significant cases, getting paid exactly the same as somebody with two months' experience. That's certainly not fair. I also have a number of supervisors who are supervising people with a great deal of responsibility and have people working under them who are making substantially more than they are. And I've tried to address that, as you saw from that letter. But I will tell you this in response to the Dr. Dougherty's comment about third-class counties. The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, which I was proud to be the president of in 2006-2007, has provided surveys of all the counties in Pennsylvania as to the district attorney's compensation. And I will tell you frankly that Lehigh County ranks very highly among third-class counties in terms of the entry-level positions. We do real well there. We're able to compete. That's a good thing. We don't do so swell as we move on and we have career prosecutors who are assuming more responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Grace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. so that we can bring final action by the board by the end of April. In the discussion we had in the last two weeks with the Gallagher group that you retained to do the pay study, the next step is phase two. Phase two will be a survey by all employees affected that they will have to fill out. The estimated time is about one to two hours. The employee will then submit that survey to their immediate supervisor and then those will all be sent down to HR. That timetable, we're trying to work out the launch of bringing it before the employees so that they are aware of the importance of this survey that they have to take. As Commissioner Holt knows, she was in the meeting with the HR director, Judy Johnston, and myself that coming up with a date in November, that's what we were working on with Mr. Goldberg from the Gallagher group. While you're talking about the survey, I'm going to ask Commissioner Holt to come up and speak to the board.
timetable of February is aggressive. We will discuss it with Mr. Goldberg on how long it will take him to compile all the information from his surveys. But it's my understanding there are four phases to this pay study. This is only phase two, correct, Commissioner? Yes, but he also had mentioned that we already completed phase four. They weren't going necessarily in order. They were working currently. So part of it had been completed already. We're going back to this one. This portion of it, it's going to take a little while to give the employees the opportunity to provide the feedback, to launch it, to select a review, and then for them to review. And trying to figure out the timing of that is a significant piece to determining what timeline we're going to do. So I think, from my understanding where we left it, that we had to figure out that piece. The administration needed to figure out what work was their schedule before they could make the commitment you're saying to when are we going to be able to wrap this up. They have to figure out when they can plug that in for what they have going on and what Gallagher needs to do to be able to create the timeline is what I understood. And so before to make a commitment to say we can get it done by this date, we have to figure that piece out. And we will, as soon as we get that date and the launch date, then we'll email the entire board so you know when that date is. And the employees will then be told as well when they must attend and start the survey. Here's my response and my concern. This pay study is being benchmarked as a significant, well, it's a significant benchmark for the commissioners. We're sitting here being asked to allocate funds in the budget. And in order, in my mind, in order to do that effectively, we need to have a firm understanding of the policies that we're trying to fund. I'm hearing the hesitation to bring this to a conclusion by the end of April so that we have the policies wrapped up by the end of April. Not from the administration's point of view, no. Our goal is to wrap this up and get a definitive from the Gallagher group as to where the county stands in relation in this case. Sure. But after that's wrapped up, there's going to be some conversation that you have to have with us. Oh, there will be some serious conversation, I'm sure, after it wraps up. That needs to have happened in advance of the budget process happening on the administration. Well, I think that we will have enough time if the stars align to get that all wrapped up before we start the budget cycle for 2020. Okay. At every meeting of leadership through the end of this year and whoever's in leadership next year, I'm going to make sure that there's an update at those leadership meetings on this subject. And if we get to the end of April, I'm going to sit up here and I'm going to be very upset if we don't have some kind of movement. I'm going to start ringing the bell because we have department heads who have come to us and given us very good rationale in support of the employees that they have. We can do so much in our capacity, not only in our time, but the charter gives us certain powers. We've got, I'm saying this now, this has got to be wrapped up. Well, in relation to the discussion this evening about non-union, it is quite surprising to me, and I believe this is the case for most of our local municipalities. If they have a contract with Teamsters or AFSCME, the administration of those townships, those cities, then gives the non-union employees the same percentage that the largest represented union has in that community. So there is no question they are on parity for their salary increase in that budget. So I don't know if that has ever been discussed here, but it really takes the question mark out of discussion in public. But no, that's the fair, that's the parity. And Commissioner Osborne, was that the case in South Whitehall? And what I need to, I don't want to get further into the policy conversations this evening. Those are important, but I need to get to the 
those are policy conversations that we need to have with a case study in hand so that we can understand the range of options. And, and I, I can't stress enough how much pressure we'll be putting on the completion of this case study. I do plan on voting no on the amendment for a host of reasons that I'm not going to get into tonight, but I, I, I'm telling you now I'm going to be aggressive yeah. on this. I appreciate that. Commissioner Osborne, was that the case in South Whitewell? You matched the non-union for the union? I think we treated the non-union folks in South Whitewell very well. But did you, did you match, or do you remember if you matched the percentage? Mr. Chair, can we move on? Yeah. I, I do have a question, a though. Um, Mr. Hosa. Yes. And, and not to put you on the spot, but really in, in the, um, consistent with Commissioner Brace's question, let me ask you this. In your opinion, in your short experience, you know that you, you and Executive Armstrong have been in county, do we need this pay study to solve the primary problem of having supervisors get paid more than their supporters? There's two, there's two trains of thought here, okay? And, and I looked at both, both avenues. Um, I think you're too far along in the pay study. I would welcome the results to come back just to see. But in hindsight, before we were here, I think you could have done it in-house. You could have done it in-house. I, I guess I'm, I'm also concerned about, you said it's stars aligned. Um, this, this, whatever, whatever is adopted tonight, it, it needs to be followed up with something that's sustainable, fair, and consistent. And we haven't even set the table for that tonight. So this, in, in my opinion, we shouldn't wait until this pay study and start talking about what is it we're going to be doing. And the pay study can maybe provide as, you know, that's not a very wise thing to do. Or when it comes, say, you know, that is consistent with what we're trying to say. But in any case, we have 30 employees. There's, to me, there's, it's not hard. It's not hard. How much money are we talking about and how do we get it to those people? Yeah. To me, well, it's that simple. Well, if there's been 30, I can tell you just in this building, there's been more than 30 that have come up to me since February of this year, uh, letting me know about what has happened here. <coughs> Chairman, may I just add one thing to that? The, the 30, as I understand it, <coughs> the 30 are 30 people today who are uh, in non-union positions who are receiving less money than union employees that they're supervising. Begs the question of how many employees would take a non-union position if the disparity wasn't so great. So that's what we don't, I, I don't, I don't know if there's a within a poll, whether we really know that hard number. But I, I didn't want to yeah, mislead you. The other thing I just noticed is that the, uh, we're told we're in a full employment economy. We're told that there are a lot of employers out there that are looking for people. And we're told that a lot of employers are, are sweetening their uh, salary and or benefit packages in order to get and retain employees. And as far as Lehigh County is concerned on the non-union employees, we're doing just the opposite. Commissioner Brams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd, I'd like to thank everybody for coming up tonight to make these comments because they're eye opening and, and we can see them throughout our lifestyle at home. I have four children, and you know, one who is in a government job is a mailman. But I have two recently, within the past three months, and my daughter just as recently as Monday took a new job. She's only three years out of school. Right, uh, but she's now taking the job with salary reduction because she's saying I have an opportunity to make more money with commission. So she's looking where she's going to be two or three years down the road. My other son told me, uh, as of recently he was a branch manager, he was like three years younger, older, older than her. He left his job. His comment was, "I'm as far as I can go with this company." So now he's looking. All right. So that's the people that are in the step two that we train and we want to retain because if you look at a, a two and a half or even a three percent raise, 
when the Social Security Administration estimates that the cost of living adjustment is going to be between 3 and 3.5 coming up, you know, it, it's almost kind of insulting, all right, that we have to do something. And on the other end of the spectrum, for the step eights, we have people that have a vast, uh, a vast level of experience that are now looking at, where am I going to go in my retirement years? I have to put maybe some kids through college. I have to afford tuition. You know, and they're competing with the cost of inflation, which Mr. Hilliard, I believe, brought up earlier. So those are things that we live or have lived as commissioners in the real life world. So you have to ask yourself, what would you do if you were that person in the controller's office that has an opportunity to go into the private sector or make more money in North Anti County? I mean, maybe they love coming to work every day in Lehigh County, but the opportunity exists to go elsewhere. They might decide to do better and do their job elsewhere, and then we have to retrain. So I, I tell you, some of the amendments that I'm seeing in front of me tonight, I don't know where we're going. I do agree with Commissioner Osborne. It puts the board in an awkward position because we should have been in a position to become aware of these figures earlier uh, because we didn't find out about them until the time the was rolled out. Uh, so that being said, I'm not saying that this isn't, uh, some of these am uh, amendments are, uh, uh, are you know, proposed. I'm just saying that we have to do a better job, in, 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 and I'm not in a position to support this amendment or really any other time. Thank you. Mr. Clerk? Oh. Mr. Dockery? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, in good consciousness that we can support 6% uh, increases. I think it's uh, too much concerning uh, what other people are making. Okay, we're going to call the vote. Roll call amendment number 20, Commissioner Zanelli? No. Commissioner Brace? No. Commissioner Brown? No. Commissioner Dockery? Yes. Commissioner Grammis? No. Commissioner Nostein? No. Commissioner Hartzell? No. Commissioner Holt? Yes. And Commissioner Osborne? No. Mr. Chairman, I recorded two votes in favor and seven votes opposed. to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> I, what I'd like to do is this. If someone would like to make that motion, then we can discuss it. If no one makes the motion, the amendment will be I'll make the as the room empties out.
affect it, and it doesn't it don't affect the tax rate if that's what you're going for out of the hotel tax fund. We've already had a discussion about um, the ballpark and, and, and such things. I mean, this is a thing that we do every year. Uh, we think that it fits best in operating because, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a festival for the community, but it doesn't sound really great for tourism generator. We could, I mean, if it were in, if it were in community development, we'd be okay with that. And my preference would actually be in community development because it is, my understanding of the use of the fund is the, um, there are first several festivals, and if you try to quantify tourism, it is harder than to quantify several festivals with one allocation. And I, I'm just trying to be mindful of that. I'm trying to draw the aim
Frankie to make that uh, several of these were increased uh, $5,000, and I'd rather see that money stay in the hotel tax fund, which will be used for repairs and the bond issue for the baseball stadium. So if we uh, keep all of these in there, we'll be in good shape that way. South White Hall, uh, the purpose there was uh, deleting that simply because that is an individual uh, township rather than something that would serve the whole county. Arts Quest is mostly in a separate county. We are not a, uh, a, uh, a sponsor of that anymore in terms of making sure that we have something within the county. Uh, da Vinci was one of the ones that was increased. Uh, we, we could use that money in the uh, uh, fund better. Uh, the King Memorial, originally uh, that was to fund the construction of that memorial, and for some reason they carried that on. I don't know if they have festivals associated with that, but assuming that they have festival associated with that, I kept some funding in the same thing with uh, uh, the uh, Bradbury Sullivan in terms of if uh, they, they have a festival also. Thank you, Mr. Brice. So I can take issue with the rationales used to, to try and justify the reductions. Um, I, I want to take most exception to the fact that we received this amendment yesterday and we had been asked uh, by the 28th of September to have amendments at least um, conceptually provided to the clerk. I have seen absolutely nothing about uh, reducing tourism dollars until yesterday. And it is grossly unfair to the organizations to not have the opportunity to prepare for this. It is grossly unfair for us to have explored the justifications. And I think it's grossly unfair to the public to have had no opportunity to review these except if they happen to have stumbled on them. So, I, I, again, I can take exception for all six of the, the individual line items, but I think, you know, we asked for, you know, roughly a week's notice in having uh, amendments ready, and I understand that there's a lot of ebb and flow, but there were a lot of other amendments that were conceptually presented to the commissioners that at least led us to understand that there was going to be something that happened. This feels like it was, Truly, honestly, the last one. And I, I don't well, think so this was done at the uh, budget hearing where Frank appeared before us. But the amendment was given to us yesterday. Well, uh, there were some extenuating circumstances. No, there were Those conversations took place more than two weeks ago. It's rude. Any other comments on amendment 22? Public comment. I would just start off by saying that I, you know, this amendment might have made more sense had you had you voted to to move the the uh, Lehigh Valley uh, Historical so the Heritage Preservation Society Johnson's contract in tourism. We had found ways to back from as it exists. I don't know what anybody gains by reducing the funding piecemeal to a couple organizations a little bit. We know that the fund balance we have projections, we know what the fund balance is, we know that everything's fine with the bond. It wouldn't have been had you voted for that, but luckily you didn't. Um, so we know that everything's fine. This is money that has to go to organizations like these, if not these anyway. I don't see any, it doesn't affect the tax rate, it's tourism, uh, it's, it's hotel tax dollars, this is what they're supposed to be for. I don't know, I don't know why to put all of them into one event, and I also don't know what the purpose that it serves. Administration. Point of order. Uh, I think uh, We're out of order. Frank uh, hit the nail on the head with looking at if we had changed the other, uh, the chamber, and uh, into this. But uh, still, I, I, I think the purpose of this is also to keep the money in that fund 
because we all realize that we're going to have problems with the, uh, the bond, paying for the bond issue in the future.